Jesus Christ superstar, brother. It's Sunday. I know it's Sunday, and that ain't Sunday music. It's unreligious. Now turn it off, huh? You mean you actually don't dig Jesus Christ superstar? Jesus Christ, I did, and I dug him a long time before you weirdos turned him into a superstar. <laughs> Brother, you walk in darkness. <laughs> All over the world, this music is turning young people on to Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 And you condemn it. Let me tell you something. Christ don't want you turning on to him. He wants you coming to him on your knees. Not wiggling and jiggling till your parts fall off. <laughs> In Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu. <laughs> What's up, guys? We're just getting started here. We're just getting started today, guys. Hold on. Hold on. We got one more for you guys. We got one more. We got to do the, the fire in the shoes. Fire in the shoes, girl. Fire in shoes. Oh, she can't put it in. She can't put it in. Oh, oh, praise Jesus. She got it in. She got her foot in the shoe. Praise the Lord. Fire. Fire. Oh, praise Jesus. Is this what you want to marry, guys? Why you shouldn't marry a Western Christian woman, part three, guys. Is this what you want to marry? I don't know which is worse. The regular Christian woman here trying to put her foot in the shoe or the the pastorist prophetess talking about fire in the shoes. Now this pastorist prophetess has a has a husband. I don't know where he's at, but he has a husband. Fire in the shoe. Fire in the shoe, guys. This, this is what you guys want to marry. <laughs> MK Mobile Gaming in the Philippines coming at you live from the Jesus Dome, safely tucked away in the corners of outer space as I watch from a distance as humanity crumbles into extinction. Being the voice of hope, a beacon of light in your darkness on earth as we wait for the promise of the return of our King, the rightful heir to the throne, Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? No, nothing did until, until Jesus. Not only did something good come out of Nazareth, the greatest thing in all of humanity came out of a place where people thought nothing good could come from. Because that is how God operates. That is how God works. God takes the most the thing that you think is the worst thing the person that you think is the worst person god takes someone like me and uses them for greatness praise god amen all you christians can get as mad as you want but can something good come out of nazareth 
not only can something good come out of Nazareth, the greatest thing that has happened in all of human history came out of Nazareth. But you guys don't like me. You Christians don't like people like me. Preaching without a theological degree. Preaching the word of God. Preaching the true word of God, not the half lies that your seminary wants me to preach. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God for the internet and for YouTube. Right? Amen. That's another thing these Christians get all mad about. Anybody can just get on. That's why they don't want you watching YouTube, by the way. Christians be censoring other Christians more than the government censors you guys, by the way. You, you don't even know you're being censored, by the way. A lot of these churches, they don't even allow you to have a YouTube app on your phone. Now, you regular Christians may not know that because they don't really enforce their rules on the regular attendees, right? But once you start working your way up into positions of authority and leadership, they're going to give you the rules. They're going to break it down to you. And you're going to find out, what the heck did I am I into? See, a lot of these people don't even know they're in a cult because they're not enforcing the rules on you regular people who just are bench warmers. Once you start serving in the church, once you once you once God moves you to be like, hey, yeah, I want to serve. I want to do more for God. So you go to your pastor thinking, you know, it's just going to be a normal thing. You just tell your pastor, hey, I'd like to serve and, and be more useful to God in his kingdom and help build the kingdom. And then they hand you the rules. And you're like, what the hell? I can't have YouTube. I can't have a TV. I can only have sex on Sunday in between morning service and evening service. The hell did I get myself into? That's how they keep the seats filled, by the way, because most people have no idea. If you're not in leadership, you have no clue that you're actually in a cult that controls everything you do, every aspect of your life. And pretty much every Christian, Western Christian religion is a cult by definition, by the way. A lot of people are saying, oh, that's a cult. That's a cult. They're all pointing fingers at each other. You're a cult. No, you're a cult. You're both cults. Just, just accept the fact that you're in a cult. Like, if you want to be in a cult, that's okay. Because a lot of people actually want to be in a cult. Just admit it. Stop pretending like it's not a cult, okay? It's okay if you want to be in a cult. I don't care. I'm getting off on a side rant here. Why you shouldn't marry a Western Christian woman, part three. Let me do my official intro. MK Mobile Gaming in the Philippines coming at you live from the Philippines. Angeles City, Clark City, Balibago, Pampanga, and all the surrounding area. I'm repping the whole neighborhood. What's going on, guys? How's life? How's it going out there, guys? What is it, Saturday night for you guys? Saturday night, having a party? You, know, you guys want to watch this Archie Bunker, Bunker thing again? Because this was kind of funny. I think I want to watch it again. Let me rewind it. We're going to watch it again. This was funny, guys. We're going to watch it again. Be funny. Screen chair. Now that's Jesus Christ Superstar, brother. It's Sunday. I know it's Sunday, and that ain't Sunday music. It's unreligious. Now turn it off, huh? You mean you actually don't dig Jesus Christ Superstar? Jesus Christ, I did, and I dug him a long time before you weirdos turned him into a superstar. <laughs> Will you get that away from turning him off? Brother, you walk in darkness. <laughs> All over the world, this music is turning young people on to Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. And you condemn it. Let me tell you something. Christ don't want you turning on to him. He wants you coming to him on your knees. Not wiggling and jiggling till your parts fall off. <laughs> oh, look at this. In Leviticus 10. <laughs> uh, good times. Good times, guys. 
good times. All right, so we are going to be doing our Bible study today. We're going to continue our series on why you shouldn't marry a Western Christian woman, part three. I think there's for sure going to be a part four. I don't know if there's going to be a part five. Maybe, maybe not. Definitely going to be part four. Oops. Oops. All right. So we have another reaction video about other Christians talking about their experience in the Christian church when it comes to marriage and relationships and women in the church, Western Christianity, so that you guys can see that I'm not just some crazy guy saying these things. Other people are experiencing them. Other people are seeing them. Other people are saying the same things I'm saying about Western Christianity in regards to marriage, relationships, and women. So we're going to do another reaction video. Uh, just pearly things has been going hard on Christianity. I think she got a little visit from her handler, her CIA deep state handler. And uh, so they, they put her in check. And so she's been going against the grain on the, the whole Christian trad con thing. Uh, she's doing what she's told. She's following her orders, but she's not lying. It's not, she's not making, she's, she's telling the truth. You know, they just don't want you to, they just, they, they don't care if you expose the truth, just as long as you don't expose their truth. You can expose everybody else's truth. Just don't expose their truth. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, guys? You know what the, the DS, we got to call it the DS. I don't think we're allowed to say deep and then state on YouTube. So we're going to have to call it the DS. So pearlie has been putting a lot of videos out, going against the grain on Christianity as well, because she got a visit from her CIA handler, and they had to put her in line. So she's doing what she's told. We're going to be doing the reaction videos, because it's true, guys. I mean, it's not. Let's see. Which one are we going to do for today? So last time we did the one where the pastor got divorced. He had uh, seven kids. Uh, they basically sent a SWAT team to his church. He almost got executed. Uh, all because his wife was lying about him. His Christian wife. Let's see, which one should we do? I guess we should just do the shortest one. Uh, let's do this one. I don't know. I can't decide. I got three more videos to react to. So there should be, this is three, four, five. There should be part five of this series. Let me speed this up. Speed this up a little bit. This is a long one. All right, let's see. Let's get into it, guys. Ready? Are you guys ready? For why you should marry a Western Christian woman, part three. Are you guys ready for the show? Let's go. Share the screen. The drummer growing up, so I had some auditions down there. Okay, so do you think Christian women are wife material? Oh, right out the box. Wow, that's really tense. <laughs> <laughs> right out the box. I appreciate about you is you always lean into the marketplace and you ask the tough questions. And uh, you're you're honestly one of my heroes in the marketplace. You're uh, definitely a fearless inquisitor. So thanks for all you do. Do you think Christian women are wife material? Hold on one second, guys. One second, I got to share the live stream. I got to share the live stream, guys.
Oh, man. Oh, there it goes. Okay, cool. Cool. Let's go into this reaction. Oh, man, I lost my viewer. I lost my viewer. Um, wow. Okay, so from my lens and with my background, um, it's interesting to take a look at this question from the angle of somebody who has a lot to lose. Um, I've actually been railroaded by the Veterans Administration for the past 12 years, so I had a six-figure business, ended up falling down because I made some agreements, it fell through, and now I have to basically start my business over. As a matter of fact, in this room right now, sorry about the background, I'm actually setting up for a digital studio in my home, so mm -hmm. apologize for the mess here. Uh, um, but as I go to build my business, one of the bigger concerns that I've had growing up as a, as a Christian was noticing a trend, and this is going to be stereotyped. I understand there are exceptions to everything. Yeah, yeah. This so is, this is, a, this is, a, this is an ex We know there's exceptions. We're talking about the rule. Right, right, right. So yeah. <laughs> um, generally, my experience, uh, whether it's a narrow lens or broad, is that there seems to be, I don't want to broad stereotype it as entitlement. But my experience, my exposure has been that there's always an interest in finding out what can the guy bring to the table? Like, what can you get? What's in it for her? Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's no difference between secular women and Christian women. They're all looking for the same thing. They're looking for the top, like, 2% of men. I know we say 10%. I'm, I'm just saying 2%. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Because if they can get the top 1%, they will. There's no, hypergamy doesn't stop at 10%, guys. We use this phrase, the top 10% in the manosphere. So once a woman get the top 10% man, what's next for her? It doesn't stop, guys. It doesn't stop until she gets to the top 1%. And even then it doesn't stop because then she's just going to divorce that guy and start over again. So she's going to divorce the top 1% guy. Uh, get half his money, half his assets, and then, you know, rinse and repeat. Then she starts over again. She starts to try and find another top 10% till she works her way up to the top 1% or whatever she thinks is the best she can do. Divorce, rinse, repeat. This is a career for women, by the way. This is an absolute career for women. Divorce is a career for women. Christian women sitting around talking about somebody who just got engaged talking about, ooh, he's a doctor, oh, he's an attorney, oh, you're young, but he's going to law school kind of situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it's it's really a struggle for me because I admire some of the conversations that have been had online, and I imagine they're not staged in some of the podcasts I've witnessed. I, I don't spend a lot of time on YouTube, but what I have seen, um, a group of women coming onto a podcast and being asked, what do you bring to the table? And it's crickets. So um, <laughs> where is this lens coming from? Well, I've been engaged once. Um, I went on deployment. She cheated while I was on the combat area. So. Oh, I no. Was she a Christian? He was engaged. He went on deployment and she cheated. And I'm assuming because he's talking about his faith, she was a Christian. Christian women are no different than secular women. Actually, they're worse than secular women because they're Christian women. I think we we can hold them to a higher level of accountability. All right. Something I'm going to talk about in my Bible study today. God gave me a little revelation. And that is the question of does God forgive your ignorance? Right? Will God forgive you for being ignorant? We're going to answer that question in our Bible study today, uh, and this this applies because we could say that secular women, because they do not know the Bible, because they don't have a faith, they don't have a religion, or maybe they just don't know it well enough, they could be given a pass for their ignorance. We could say that. However, Christian women, on the other hand, because they know better, because they're in church, because they're supposed to know their word, the word of God, because they're supposed to know the rules of the Bible, uh, because they're Christian women, we could we could say that we could hold them to a higher level of accountability for their actions because they know better. They are not acting out of ignorance. So that's my argument here when it comes to why Christian women are actually worse than secular women, because secular women, we could say they just don't know. They're acting out of ignorance. They don't know the word of God. Whereas Christian women have been taught 
how they are expected to behave by God according to his word, and yet they still continue to act just as bad, if not worse, than secular women. Or worldly women, if you want to use that word or that term, terminology. So what's the difference, guys? This guy just said he was engaged. He's a Christian. I'm assuming she was a Christian. He got deployed. She cheated. It's exactly the same thing worldly women do. So what is the difference? Can you guys point out the difference? The only difference I can see is that the Christian woman is expected, because she's a Christian, to not cheat. And yet she does it anyways. Let's keep going. That didn't work out. Um, I was getting ready to ask someone else to marry me, but she had professional aspirations and she wanted to go somewhere else. So I wished her the best. I wanted her to be successful. So that didn't work. Oh, here we go. Another Christian woman focusing on her career, not marriage. Who else focuses on their career instead of marriage? Oh, worldly women, secular women. Mm. Once again, absolutely no difference between the Christian women and the worldly women. No difference whatsoever. Let's keep going. Didn't work out so much. Um, I'm currently not dating on a voluntary basis. I also probably don't fit the typical stereotype of a man. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I'm not voluntarily going out and screwing anything that's available, um, including the tree or you know fire hydrant down the street. It's just not who I am. I'm probably the exception. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you're the exception, sir. I think a lot of guys are... Um not smoking, not drinking. And, uh, you know, guys, in the West, it just takes too much time, energy, and money to uh, really invest in even taking a woman out on a date with the hope of maybe getting laid. Like, it's just, it's just easier just to stay home and play video games at this point, even though Christians have a problem. That's why Christians don't want you playing video games either, because they know that once you become content in your situation, uh, or even happy for that matter, you're not going to be chasing their Christian women, trying to wife up their 350 pounds single mother Christian women who came back to the Lord after they had three kids and said, oh, now I want a good Christian man. And I, and I want him to wait. <laughs> Let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about this. Just hold on one second, guys. These single mothers in church, this is, this is mind-blowing to me. These single Christian mothers. So you're a single mother. So we know, because of the, the babies, that you are not a virgin. And uh, you did not make that man, and because we know you're a single mother, you, you didn't make that man wait until he married you. You might be divorced, I don't know, but most of the time they're they were never even married. Uh, so you didn't make that guy wait. But whenever these single mothers start coming to church, all of a sudden, they want to find a good Christian man and they want to make him wait until he wipes them up before she comes out of those panties. I'm like, you're already used the goods. And now you think that you're in a position to make a man wait? If you're a single mother in church, you need to be dropping them panties on the first date. Now, I know that doesn't sound very Christianly. I'm just giving you women some honest advice. That man has a lot better options than wasting his time with you, a single mother, probably overweight. You need to be cooking and effing that man if you want to keep him. I don't care how Christian and how saved you are. That is the, the cold, hard truth of the reality of your situation. You have no right to make a Christian man wait for you to marry you before you give him sex. When you did not make the man, the father of your children wait for you, you have no right. You have no ground to stand on. You already gave it up to that guy. You might, if you really, if you really genuinely want a good Christian man, you should give him the same thing you get, give yourself to that man the same way you gave your body to that other man with 
without w making anybody wait. Nope, you just gave it up. I'm just saying. I'm trying to help you ladies out. I know it goes against everything you've been taught, all the half lies of Christianity. But <laughs> it's very simple and easy to get a man and keep a man. You feed him, you fuck him. And then you should be good. I mean, you know, you let him play video games, watch TV, whatever his hobbies are, you let him do that. You know, and you should be good. He should keep you around. As long as he's getting food, sex, and he's, he's you're, you know, giving him his space to work on his hobbies, whatever they may be, video games, sports, golf, who knows, whatever it is. Let the man do what he wants to do in his private time. Let, give the man some hobby time. If, if a man has those three things, he's going to be pretty content and pretty happy. He's going to keep you around. It's really that simple. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're not. This is the basic, you know, how to keep a man, whether you're a Christian or not. And, and, and women know this. They just refuse to do it. And all, honestly, there's another video I'm going to review from Pearly where she's talking about how the church actually wants people to stay single. Because when you're when these women are single and these men are single, then they're dependent on the church. Right. They don't want you to be to have your own little family because then you might not you might stop going to church because that, that happens a lot too. people go to church. They are praying for God to do something for them. And then when God does it, they forget about God. That's another sermon. That's another story. But the singleness really keeps people in the seats of church because they're they're single. They're lonely. They're bored. That's their that's their little social group. Uh, they go to church so they won't be because they can hang out with their friends and, you know, they won't be lonely for a little while. They go to fellowships. Church has a lot of activities to keep you busy, especially if you're single and lonely. So it's a good place for single people to kind of it helps them cope with their singleness and their loneliness very well. So that is one of the reasons why the church has so many of these rules that are not in the Bible when it comes to marriage and dating is because they actually do want to keep you single because they want you to stay in the They want you to be dependent on the church. They do not want a single woman having a husband and then that husband being the leader in the house telling her, you know, hey, I don't think this church is for us because the, the husband's ultimately going to make the decision about what church they're going to. And, you know, if the preacher starts preaching a little bit too uh, feminine, you know, the man might say, you know, let's let's try a different church. This, this guy's this preacher's getting kind of gay. I think we need to move to another church, you know, and obviously if she is a good Christian woman, she's going to follow the leadership of her husband. And that church is going to start losing people. And that's just one example. All right. That's if they go to church at all. You know, the man might say, you know what? All these churches are full of shit. We're not going to church. I'm going to stay home and read my Bible. And because uh, that's what a lot of men are doing these days. Men are not against God. Men are not against the Bible. Men are against religion. They're against the church. They're against the beta male westernized matriarchal christianity that's what they're against men love god men love studying their bibles i know lots of men who read their bibles i'm one of them so men do not have a problem i'm just i've reached the point of maturity where i can still go to church and just kind of you know eat the meat and spit out the bones but most men haven't reached that point of maturity where they are, they just kind of stop going to church altogether uh, because they're just sick of the crap and the lies and uh, just getting beat over their head. A lot of these Western, when especially if you're in a matriarchal Christian church, they just beat the man over the head every Sunday. You just go and they tell you how you're not a good enough man. Like, how is that? That's not going to encourage anyone, a man, to want to go to church when he goes to church every Sunday and all they do is tell him how he's not good enough, how he needs to be better. The man's already going to work, paying his bills, taking care of his family. And then he goes to church and they tell him, oh, you need to work on this. You need to communicate more with your wife and blah, blah, blah. Communication is nowhere in the Bible, by the way. That's another lie from Christianity. You can't. I'm not saying you shouldn't communicate with your wife. But biblically, you don't have to. As long as you're providing, the Bible is very simple. You're pro you provide food, shelter, clothing, conjugal rights, and that is the only responsibilities that the man has. All this communication crap, 
That is beta male westernized Christianity. All right. I'm not saying you shouldn't communicate with your wife. I'm just saying biblically, you don't have to if you don't want to. And that's what Christianity does. Christianity forces men to communicate against their will. Now, men will usually communicate when they want to, but making a man communicate when he doesn't want to just doesn't really work. All right. Just doesn't really work out. And then a woman doesn't respect you. If you communicate too much, the woman's going to lose respect for you. And then you're not going to have authority in your household. However, if you live in the United States, you already don't have authority in your household because the government is the authority in your home. The government's the authority. The pastor's the authority. Everybody has authority in your house except for you if you live in the West. But let's get back to it, guys. That was a long little detour. I just wanted to talk about the uh, <laughs> these single mothers talking about, you need to marry me. You need to wait and we have to wait until we get married. The pastor said we got to wait until we get married. She has three kids. She has three kids. She's trying to make you wait. Because you're supposed to be the good Christian cleanup guy. Oh, no, you got to wait, sir. Those other three baby daddies didn't have to wait. That's another thing, too. They got different baby daddies. She got three baby daddies. She got three kids and four baby daddies. But then four baby daddies didn't have to wait. How come you got to wait? It's about respect, too, guys. The guy she makes wait is the guy she doesn't respect. If she respected you, she wouldn't make you wait. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, it's just characterizing the lens that I'm seeing this from. Um, I've wanted to be a father at an early age. Um, I wanted to be a worthy husband and father and grow up and take care of myself to such a degree that I would be able to provide for somebody. Um, you know, due to the nature of the world and how it is right now, I'm putting my personal relationship ambitions on hold to build up my financial prowess. Um, but to steer this back into the topic, um, I, I find it a struggle because if I have a lot to lose, I'm hesitant to go into the market in this day and age with the dynamic the way it is right now because of the lens that I'm looking at this through. Whereas if somebody's going to look at me as a possible husband, um, I'm concerned that they're looking at my pocketbook, they're looking at my ATM, they're mm -hmm. looking at what's in it for them, uh, whether it's intimacy related, financial related, um, household related. So this man said he started a business, so he does have a lot to lose. He can lose half his business, probably all his business. Uh, that's a lot because what happens when you have, when you are, when you're a business owner and you have a divorce, what happens, like when you work for yourself and you go through a divorce, what they do is they will hire what is called a financial investigator. And that is someone who is exactly what it says they do they they investigate all your find they find any money you have if you have a secret stash in your mattress they are going to find it uh and they are going to tell the judge because they're trying to get the biggest amount of money they can possibly get so the judge can let's say let's say one week because when you work for yourself maybe you don't make the same amount of money every week right maybe one week you made you know, twenty five hundred dollars. The next week, you made three thousand or five thousand, depending on how your how business is going with your company, right? So you're not making a fixed amount. Like if you had a normal job, a nine to five, you know, you make they pay you twenty three dollars an hour, right? So you you know how much you're gonna make every week because it's the same amount, unless you work overtime or whatever. But when you're a business owner, it could fluctuate, right? based on sales, based how business is doing, based on how the economy is doing, you don't know. So they'll hire this financial investigator and this financial investigator's job is to get, get your salary as high as he possibly can. <laughs> What's up, Jack? Is that you? I apologize, Jack. I'm sorry for making fun of you. Ah. Oh, Jack, now, see, you're killing me with kindness, Jack. You're a better man than me. You're killing me with kindness. Thank you for joining the live stream, Jack, even though I made fun of you. I don't take offense. Okay, I'm going to stop making fun of you. Now I can't. You, you softened my heart.
Jack. You really did. That's it. I'm not going to make fun of you anymore. You're right. You're right. It's not funny no more. It's over. It was the joke went on for too long. It, it became not funny anymore. <laughs> I've had worse. <laughs> I'll find someone else to make fun of. Uh, honestly, I was just entertaining myself. It wasn't. It wasn't personal. It was my own personal entertainment. I was entertaining myself. You're right. Nobody was laughing. I was the only one laughing at myself. I laugh at my own jokes. I laugh at my own fart jokes. <laughs> I needed a rest from that delusional girl. Uh, well, I appreciate four years of delusion. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, checking out the live stream. We are talking about why you should marry a Western Christian woman. Part three. Uh, we're doing a reaction video to pearly things. If you don't know, Jack, I am a very religious man. Uh, so I don't know if this is your thing or not. You may not may not be interested in this, and that's okay. Uh, but that's what we do here on my channel. We talk about Christianity and stuff. Uh, we do a little Bible study. And, uh, and, and we have fun. I make jokes on my channel. Not me, mate. Oh, okay. Well, it's okay. You don't. Thanks for thanks for stopping by. Thanks for stopping by. So we're we're doing reaction videos to these uh these Christian beta males who. You know. I mean, it's in the title. Why you shouldn't marry a Western Christian woman? Because they're no better than the worldly one. They're no better than the the regular Western women. In fact, they're worse because they're supposed to know better. Let's continue with the show. Thanks for stopping by, Jack. Uh, if it's clout related, um, I, I've known to uh, end up in circles that are highly influential. <laughs> Very rapidly, I would find myself speaking. Oh, so what I was saying about the um, the financial advisor, I mean, if they have financial investigator, is that if this guy owns his own company he may be making a different amount of money every week because it's his business you know you don't know business could be slow one week so they're going to hire a financial investigator and what the financial investigator's job is to do is to basically come up with the largest amount of money that this man could potentially make so they can go tell the judge even if even if this guy only makes 100k a year they're going to go tell the judge that this guy has the potential of making like 200k a year right and so the judge is going to make a ruling on what the financial investigator says, which is, is which is not what this guy is actually making in the event he gets divorced, by the way. So the judge is going to say, OK, you have the potential of making 200K a year. So the judge is going to say this is we're going to set your uh, so your child support is going to be like eight thousand dollars a month. Uh, your alimony is going to be like twelve thousand dollars a month. And because you have the potential of making two hundred thousand dollars a year, but in reality, this guy only makes a hundred k a year. But they don't care about that because the financial advisor, the financial investigator, is going to say this guy could be could potentially make this much this amount of money. He's not making that amount of money, but he could because they're gonna they're gonna look at your bank statements, your check stubs, whatever. They're gonna take the highest amount they can find. And they're going to say, okay, this is what you can make every month or every week. That's not what you actually make, though. You might, some some weeks, you might not make any money if you own your own company. I don't know. So that's how the financial investigator works for the family court system, especially if you work for yourself and you own your own company. It's very dangerous. It's even, it's, it's more dangerous to get divorced if you own your own company than it is if you just have a regular job. So people, I would strongly advise men who are entrepreneurs, you cannot be in a relationship. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you just cannot. It's just too dangerous. It is way, way, way too dangerous because you do not know because then you're stuck. Once that financial investigator tells that judge, that you you have the potential of making 200 300k a year oh i don't know then 
you know, you're stuck paying that amount, whatever the judge ruling is, you're stuck paying that amount for 18, 20, 30, could be lifetime. I mean, Florida just got rid of lifetime alimony. So we don't know what other states still have lifetime alimony in place. Uh, could be the rest of your life. So you could be an 80 year old man still trying to pay your 12K a month alimony to your ex wife from like 60 years ago. Can you imagine that? How are you going to do that? But you have to. You're just going to have to figure it out or you're going to go to jail or you're going to be an 80 year old man in jail getting butt raped because because you couldn't pay your alimony because you just got too old to work. That's your retirement. If you get married in the West, that's what you're risking. You're risking a retirement of being 80 years old in prison getting butt raped because you couldn't pay your alimony. Why would you do that? Just why? Makes no sense, guys. Why would you put yourself at risk like that? Let's get back to it. Speaking with people that are centers of influence, and I'm grateful for that privilege to be able to network with some great people that have those networks. Uh, but whatever somebody is chasing in a spouse that they're looking for, one of my concerns is they're not looking for love. They're not looking for somebody that's a suitable person for them. Um, and that's my you know, individualized lens. I acknowledge it. Um, that being said, I'm very concerned about you know, going to another location in the United States. I prefer to live in the United States. And wherever I go to try and date, I'm concerned that it's going to be less about whether we're a fit and more about what they're going to get from me. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very hesitant to go into the market and actually seriously date at the moment. I still want to. I still want to try. And I'm 100% interested in becoming a husband someday. He still just, wants to. I want to be very careful, and I'm not sure. How I mean, are you listening to this, guys? He still wants to. He knows the reality of the situation, and he still wants to try. That's what's messed up about these guys. Like, they see the matrix, and they still want to try. I'm just talking about the family court system, Jack. I mean, if you haven't been married or divorced, you're, you're probably not going to know what I'm talking about. Have you been married or divorced? If you have been married and divorced, then you should be fully aware of what I'm talking about. Most men who haven't been married and divorced actually have no clue as to how bad uh, the family court system really is in America. They don't know. They don't know they don't have any rights because they've never been. I mean, honestly, you don't have any rights in America. It's an illusion. Thinking you have rights in America is the biggest illusion in any in the whole world, like especially as a man. You have because. The government can do whatever they want. They can just come to your house, take you to jail. Who's going to stop them? No one's going to stop them. No one's going to do anything. No one cares about you. No one cares about the individual person, you. They could come take you to jail, put you, lock you away in a dungeon. No one's going to give a crap. Not even, it's not going to make news. No one cares. You have no rights in America. You have no freedom in America. It's all an illusion. The only reason they allow these YouTube channels to be up is to, this is controlled opposition. It's to, keep the illusion going they let these people go on youtube and say things anti-government things and whatever just so you guys can think you have like some freedom of speech or whatever which you, you don't because they know they know they can come to your house and take you off anytime they want that's why they're not worried about what people say on the internet <laughs> no way dude some of these guys will never learn i know right this guy I'm talking about this guy right now. He literally just said, oh, he still wants to try. He's literally talking about the reality. Like he knows the reality of the situation. And he still says, oh, I still want to try. Oh, I still want to try. So he's going to be one of those guys that's never going to learn. Like he's still going to, he's always going to have that hope deep down inside, you know, like, uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I would advise this man have, and because he's looking at it through the, the lies of Christianity. So he's trying to do everything within the rules of Christianity. And that's why he can't have a relationship. I would advise this guy, hey, have a relationship. Just don't have a marriage license. But because his Christianity is lying to him, saying that he has to go to the pimp daddy government and get a marriage license. That's where he's he's getting messed up. That's where he he can't he can't put it together, right? Because he's trying to do things within the confines of the rules of Christianity, which are not the rules of the Bible. And he's trying to be a good guy. He's trying to be a good Christian, 
and he just can't get it because it doesn't work. Those the rules of Christianity do not work for a man who's trying to not get butt raped in prison when he's 80 years old because he can't afford to pay his lifetime alimony. But if he was actually following the Bible, then he could have a relationship. He could even have a biblical marriage without a government marriage license. And as long as they don't have that marriage license, they have no authority to make decisions on your money and your life. You give them authority. When you sign that, see, the devil can't do anything without your permission. Remember in Job, when the devil has to go to God and ask permission to go fuck with Job, right? He can't do anything without your permission. The reason they want that marriage license and the reason why your pastor, your Western Christian pastor, will force you to go get a marriage license is because, for one, they work for the state. They work for the government. They don't care about God. And number two, they you have to give permission to the devil. When you sign that marriage license, it is you giving permission to the devil to come into your life, to come into your marriage, to do whatever he wants to do. It, this is spiritual, guys. This whole thing, and the government knows it. The government knows the Bible better than you know it. That's why they make you get a marriage license, because they know they have no jurisdiction over your life until you sign, until you give them permission. They know they cannot have, they don't have any authority or power until you sign the marriage license. And once you do that, it's all over for you. The devil comes in, the government comes in, does whatever he wants to do. And you, you just made yourself a slave. You made yourself an indentured slave to the state, to the government. And you did it. You gave them permission because you signed the paper. And that's why they don't feel bad about it. That's why they have no guilt about what they do to you, because you gave them permission when you signed that paper. Let's keep going. How to navigate the waters right now. I don't know if somebody is actually going to be on the hunt for something that I can provide them or something that's going to be a mutual fit. Am I good for her and is she good for me? Does that make sense? No, I'm really glad you said that because I find more men in your position where they actually want to be married. They're not really, because they always have this idea that if men aren't married, they're sleeping around, they're going and doing all of this stuff. But I find men in your situation to be more common than the men that are just trying to run through a bunch of women. I, I find men want relationships. It's just, how do, you, how do you do that? So I'm curious, do you notice a difference in the quality between Christian women and non-Christian women? There's no right or wrong answers. It's just based on your, <laughs> it's just based on your experience. Right, right. So here's my experience. Um, and I want to qualify this. Okay. Um, women that are loyal and practicing Christians, I, I see there being a higher quality. Okay. Um, <laughs> people who are women who are religious, people who are, I don't want to call it fanatical. Fanatical. See, he's still, he still got hope. <clears throat> you can tell this guy. And I guess it's better to have hope than, than to not. <laughs> but <laughs> this dude, what this dude, this dude needs to learn how to be happy with himself. That's that's another piece of advice I would give this dude is that, number one, if you can't be happy alone, uh, then you have no business being in a marriage. First and foremost, if you are not happy with yourself by yourself, you are not mature enough to be in a marriage. That I would give that advice to any any human being, Christian or not, uh, and the re especially if you're a man. And the reason for that is because when we go to Genesis, Adam was uh, created first, right? Adam was alone. There was a time, there was a period of time when Adam was alone before Eve came. This is why men can be alone. This is why men have man caves because we want to go and be alone. It's in our like, it's in our DNA. This is like something genetic from the beginning of time, right? Where if you're a man, you should seek out solitude. I'm not saying all the time because the Bible also says it's not good for a man to be alone, but you should have time. You should look forward to time being by yourself. You know, and you're not you're not like doing nothing. You're by yourself. Maybe you're in your man cave. You're you're working on your hobbies. You're building a model plane or playing video games or 
whatever you're doing. My point is, I know a lot of guys who don't like to be alone. And I, whenever I see that, I think that's kind of like a feminine aspect. A man who can't be alone is that's feminine. That's not masculine. Men are Adam was created first. He was alone for a period of time before Eve showed up. Uh, not also Adam was alone with God, by the way. So he wasn't completely alone. He was alone with God. And that is why the man is the spiritual authority in the household, because Adam had more time alone with God before Eve showed up. So Adam had had a better understanding of God even before Eve showed up because he spent time with him. That's another thing as men we need to do. We need to be spending time alone with God. A lot of times what these Christian churches will do is they'll keep you too busy. You know, you got church on Sunday mornings, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. You got these revivals through the week. You got all kinds of conferences. You got the marriage thing. You got this thing. You got all kinds of the youth thing going on. And these Christians get so busy doing stuff in the church that they don't even have time to read their Bibles and like actually be alone with God. And then they tell you, oh, you can't forsake the fellowship. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't give a damn about your fellowship. All right. The most important thing to me is spending time alone with God because you, 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 that fellowship doesn't mean nothing. When you're fellowshipping, yeah, that's great. And that's fun and all. But that's not an intimate relationship with God. You don't you have sex with your wife by yourself, right? It's just you and her, right? That's the bond. You don't you don't have a fellowship sex. You're not having orgies. All right. God wants you alone with him. That's when the intimacy happens. That's when you build your relationship with God. That's when you strengthen your faith. That's when the revelations come. That's when God gives you wisdom and understanding. You can fellowship all day long, but you're not going to hear from God. Because God can't, you can't hear God in all that noise. I'm just telling you right now. You just can't. It's too much distractions. You know, you got to get alone with God. So my point is, this man is like, he, he's having issues with being alone. If you're a man, I'm fine being alone. I, 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 I could spend all day in my room by myself. I could play video games. I could read my Bible. I could pray. I can exercise. And I, that would be the, that's like the best day for me, by the way. Honestly, I enjoy that. I enjoy that too much to the point where God has to work on me in that area. Because like I said, the Bible also says it's not good for a man to be alone. Some, some men like being alone too much. <laughs> so there has to be balance. And that's one of the things that God works on me with, but that's my problem. But I see most men have the opposite problem where they can't. They can't be alone. And I'm like, no, women are the ones who can't be alone because women have never actually been alone because Adam was always there, right? Eve was created after Adam. Adam was always there. Eve was never alone. She had Adam. She had God. She had the serpent. You know, she had friends, right? Eve had friends, the serpent. I mean, he wasn't a good friend, but Eve went and talked to him. So that's what women do. Women do stupid things like talk to snakes, right? <laughs> that's why women, they're always wearing those little crystals around their neck. Oh, this is my power crystal. It gives me energy. No wonder women talk to snakes. You guys are acting like it's impossible for a woman to talk to a snake in the Bible. Have you talked to a woman these days, the crazy things they say? Yeah, I guess you're right. He is he does look young. Uh it could it could be an age thing. Um Yeah, I get, yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of younger guys still just holding out holding out that hope. Uh I just think he's struggling with trying to do the right thing according to western christian rules as opposed to just um just have a girlfriend, uh, you know, have a relationship, just don't have a marriage license. So he, he that's where Christianity is actually hurting people and hurting men because the, the rules are not protecting men. They're actually hurting men. And he knows this, and that's why he's like, oh, I've got to find the best. Because he knows if he gets the wrong woman, he is screwed. Like, he knows he's screwed. 
So he's like, oh, I got to find the right one. I got He's struggling just trying to find that one that's not going to screw him over. Because, you know, he knows he's got to sign that marriage license. And once he does, he is screwed. But he doesn't know what the Bible really says. Because Christian, Christians have been lying to him his whole life. You don't, there, nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to have a marriage license uh, from the government. Show me that in the Bible. Uh, but Christian pastors will not marry you without it. Secondly, uh, Christian pastors, they won't marry gay people who get the same marriage license that they require a heterosexual couple to get. Make no sense. Why would you force a heterosexual couple to get the same marriage license that gay people get, but then you say you're against gay marriage? Pick a side, Christians. Pick a freaking side. If I, I, would, I would go to the pastor and I would say this. Pastor, uh, if I have to get a marriage license, you have to marry a gay couple. When you start marrying gay people, I'll go get a marriage license. That's the deal. That's the deal I'm making. Now, if you're not going to marry gay people, then you need to marry me without a marriage license. That is the deal I will make with you, Pastor. If you can't make that deal, then I'm sorry. I am not getting a marriage license. You either marry gay people, and I'll go get a marriage license, or you don't marry gay people, and you marry me without a marriage license. And then your marriage is under God. People Also, people don't understand how spiritual this is. Once you get that marriage license, God is not in your marriage. I don't care how much these Christians want to believe that God is in their marriage. You have signed God out of your marriage. God left your marriage. God said, okay, you rather have the government than me, so I'm going to get out. It's the same thing that happened with, uh, okay, so remember when, when the people, when Samuel... Uh, went God, the people wanted a king over them, right? They didn't want God to be their leader anymore. They wanted a king because they literally said in the Bible, we want to be like the other nations who have a king that rules over them, right? And God said, okay, I'm going to let you guys have a king rule over you, but he's going to oppress the crap out of you, right? That's what happens when you go and get the marriage license. God says, okay, you want this government to be in charge? Okay. I'm going to let you have that government be in charge of your marriage. But that government's going to oppress the crap out of you. And what do they do? What happens when you go get a divorce? That government that you gave authority to, they take everything away from you. And you're going to be 80 years in prison getting butt raped because you can't afford to pay your lifetime alimony. And you have no one to blame but yourself. Because you signed your authority over to the government instead of letting God be in control of your life and your marriage. And you know why you did it? Because your Christian pastor told you to do it. Because they indoctrinated you to do it. Because you believe you have to do it. Because you grew up learning this crap. So I understand that it's hard for people who have been told their whole life that they have to get a marriage license. It's hard to come out of that lie, and it's not going to happen overnight. All right, If you've been told something for 20 years, it's going to take you more than a few days to get over it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It might take you another 20 years to get over that lie. So we have to have some mercy and some grace when we're dealing with Christians who are indoctrinated, who live in the lie, and who are having a hard time struggling coming out of the lie. Uh, we have to have some patience with them. It's going to take them some time. It's not going to happen overnight. They've been living a lie for 20, 30, 40 years. It's going to take a lot more than a couple of days or a couple of conversations for them to come out of the lie. Uh, fortunately, a lot of people are now these days. Uh, praise God. God is opening, especially this guy. This guy's, you know, he has some wisdom. He has some understanding, but he's still struggling. He's still trying to live in the confines of religious rules, of Christian rules that are not biblical. Let's keep going. 
but they're, they do what they say they're going to do, right? They keep their word. So if they say they're religious, if they say they're practicing, then they're actually practicing. They're not visiting once a week just because it's a check in the box. Mm. Um, they're not doing things uh, in the public eye. And then once nobody's seeing them behind closed doors, their character changes. And I think that's a really good test of character is what are you doing when nobody's looking? Mm. When nobody's watching you or holding you accountable, or are you holding yourself accountable? Um, maybe this is a military person inside of me. Maybe this is a musician or somebody who's toured the nation as a drummer or something. I don't know what it is in me, but the idea of extreme ownership is something that I take to heart. And I admire that quality in the women that I have dated because there's no question that they're acknowledging what's going on with them. They, they are on a path of personal development by choice. They're not doing it to try and, uh, what, what's, the, what's the phrase? Trap a man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trap a man. Um, they're more interested in doing what is right. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, brother. Yes, it took me over 10 years to accept the red pill. Um, I'm still learning. I'm st I've been in the manosphere since 2012. I found it. Uh, so what's that? 12, 10, like 12 years. Yeah, that's 12 years. <laughs> that's 12 years. I've been in the manosphere for 12 years. And uh, honestly, when I first started uh, binging, I don't know, binging Red Pill, uh, I was just happy. I was just happy to find people who, because, you know, you think you're alone. You think you're the only one who thinks that way. And then when you finally find other people, other men, you're like, oh, God, thank God. Praise the Lord. I thought I was, because they try to make you think you're crazy, right? Like other people will try and make you think you're crazy for thinking the way you do. Especially other Christians, other normies. Other normies will be like, what's wrong with you? Why do you think that way? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, it, it's all you. And you start to believe it, you know, because you don't, you don't have, you don't know anyone else. So when I found the red pill, I was just, it was a sense of relief. It was like, thank God I'm not the only one out there. Like, thank God I'm not crazy. They're crazy. So I was like, praise the Lord. But yeah, I'm still learning every day. Uh, it's more to me, and the Bible is very red pill too. I mean, which is why I, I love my faith and I love the Bible and I love God, just because the truth that is in the Word of God really lines up with red pill philosophy, which is why I think a lot of more, uh, I think a lot of men, red pill men, are very religious, are very spiritual. And, you know, they might not be religious, but they have some some spiritual aspect to them their personality i've noticed a lot of red pill men that i talk to are very open about god stuff uh and some of them are very religious actually uh so because i think there's there's a connection i see the connection when i read the bible i see i you know i watch red pill content and then i read the bible and i say oh well this this kind of lines up right kind of makes sense this makes this this agrees with the Bible, as opposed to Christianity, which doesn't agree with the Bible. Because Christianity, westernized Christianity, is a matriarch, matriarchal religion that is completely, that's in opposition to the Bible. All right. Like I've made videos before. How do you reconcile red pill ideology with Christian theology? Well, I don't. Christians have their own. They, Christians need to write their own book. Christians need to be like Mormons and make their own book because they have their own rules. Christians have a lot of rules that are not biblical. So I'm not trying to reconcile a red pill ideology with Christian theology. Christian theology doesn't matter. What the Bible says matters. So I'm saying there is a lot of comparisons between red pill theology, ideology, and what the Bible actually says, not what Christians say, because Christians basically worship women. So Western Christian, Western Christianity is a matriarchal religion that worships women. That's why they celebrate Mother's Day, which is fertility worship. They're about to celebrate Easter, which is transgender worship because bunnies can't lay eggs. All right. Bunnies don't re reproduce. In the way that they're trying to say they do, which is actually transgenderism. Uh, so if you tell your kids a bunny can lay eggs, why would you tell your kids a man can't have a baby? 
that's another one of those things where Christians are kind of like not making sense. Pick a side, guys. Pick a side. Either a bunny can lay eggs and a man can have babies, or a bunny can't lay eggs and a man can't have babies. Which ones are going to be Christians? Proverbs are full of red pill. Exactly. And the Apocrypha, by the way. The Apocrypha is actually, this is my 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 belief as to why they took the Apocrypha out of the Bible is because it's more red pill than the rest of the Bible. If you read the book of Sirach, I strongly encourage everyone to read the book of Sirach and the Apocrypha. Uh, you should be able to find it in a bookstore or go to a Catholic church and get a Catholic Bible. I think they still have the Apocrypha in their Bibles. Uh, so, and the first thing, the first thing when you get an Apocrypha is read the book of Sirach. The very first book you need to read is the book of Sirach. It will blow your mind. Everything in that book is about women. It's about the, about women, uh, the true nature of women. I mean, it warns men. It it's just mind blowing. I really believe that's the reason they took it. They took the apocrypha out of the Bible just because it it really exposes women, uh, and, they, and they couldn't they couldn't have that. They couldn't have men coming to the truth of a female nature uh, any sooner than we already have. I mean, look at we've we've realized the truth of female nature now. Uh, but if we had the apocrypha, we may have come to this. Uh, truth a lot a lot sooner because men actually do read their Bibles whereas most women don't most women go to church to hear a pastor tell them what the Bible says even though it's lies that makes women feel good <clears throat> let me see let me get my Bible here it's not a fruit of the Spirit, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me look up the book of Sirach. Here it is. Oh, I got my bookmark in here. Sirach is my favorite book in the Apocrypha. I'm telling you guys, you gotta, you guys gotta get this book. You guys got to get this book. Can you see the title there? I don't know if you guys can see it. I'll type it in the chat. I'll type it in the chat. If you don't read anything, guys, read the book of Sirach. It's gonna blow your minds. There you go. That's how you spell it. Sirach. So, I don't know. You can buy an Apocrypha on Amazon or you can uh, I don't, you can just go to a Catholic church and like steal one of their Bibles or something. Or, oh, no, what you can do is, what I do is I go, go to a thrift store, by the way. Thrift stores usually have like a lot of Bibles. And they have like a lot of older Bibles because, you know, I don't know, people die and they just like their families give all their stuff away. And so they will have if you go to a thrift store, you could probably find an older Bible that has an Apocrypha in it. And it'll be like three bucks or something. It'll be like super cheap, too. So I bought the Bible I'm using. I literally bought at a thrift store. Or like a um, like a Goodwill store or something. Oh, it looks like my internet's messing up. All right, let's get back to the reaction video. We're already over an hour and we still haven't done our Bible study. And I got a really good Bible study today, guys. Not like the scripture, but just like a tiny little revelation that I wanted to talk about today. Kind of goes with our scripture. Uh, so we definitely got to do our Bible study today. And it's technically Sunday in the Philippines. And I didn't go to church today. I'm being bad. I'm a bad Christian. I didn't go to church to check my church box today. But you know what? I'm loving my wife like Christ loved the church. You know why? Because I'm letting my wife sleep. Because she's tired from work. So I don't know. Is, am, am I? What am I doing? Am I being right or wrong, guys? Am I being a good Christian or a bad Christian? Am I a bad Christian because I didn't go to church? Or am I a good Christian? Because I'm loving my wife like Christ loved the church, and she's too tired, and she needs to rest. So,
I didn't really go through red pill rage though. I know, I mean, I know I can understand men going through red pill rage. I just, I never went through it. I just, it's kind of cause I always, this has always been a spiritual thing for me guys, by the way, like since I was literally like 12 years old, like God kind of just like supernaturally put this stuff in my head. Cause I remember having conversations like with my mom and like with my grandmother and they were looking at me like I was crazy about red pill stuff. I was talking about red pill stuff when I was 12 years old, guys. I'm not even making I'm not even making this stuff up. <laughs> There's no good you're right. Uh I know, but I'm just I'm just because you know they're like, you know, Christians, <laughs> you miss a couple of Sundays at church and the pastor is calling you, like, are you okay? Are you smoking crack behind a dumpster? I'm fine, Pastor. I'm busy. Damn, leave me alone. Click. I'm working. Jeez. You don't know? How come every time you miss church, everyone thinks you're smoking crack behind a dumpster? Maybe I had to work on Sunday. Maybe I'm working overtime, Pastor. Maybe I'm trying to pay my rent. All these people going to church praying to Jesus because they can't pay their rent, but they don't go to work. I'm just putting God first. It's like that story about the man who's like stranded on the island and God sends a boat and a plane and a helicopter. And he's like, no, I'm just waiting on God. Go to work. Stop going to church praying because you can't pay your rent. Just go to freaking work until you can pay your rent and go to church when you're done. <laughs> oh no is this is this about the grace gospel are, are you are you are you one of those christians who's like too much grace i'm I'm not against grace guys i'm not because we all need we all need grace yep jesus said there are none that are good i'm just trying to be good by christian standards i know i'm not good all right but christians they got a whole level of self-righteousness. They think they can check all the boxes and they're going to be, and that, and that makes them good. <clears throat> yeah, that's a Catholic dogma. What is the Catholic dogma? Grace or? I'm not, I'm not completely sure what, what point you're trying to make, sir. You can become good by the blood of Christ. Yeah, well, God doesn't see you. God doesn't see you. He, God sees everyone through the blood of Christ. But it's like he can't even God. The, Christ, God, unlike Christians, doesn't see your sin because God sees you through the blood of Christ, which covers your sin. Even the people who are not saved yet, and I know that's a radical statement, but Christians are going to be like, "Oh, if you're not saved, you're going to hell." No, no, calm down, calm down. All right. Because the Bible also says that it's not God's will that anyone should perish. If you're not saved, it just means Jesus might still be working. Doesn't mean you're going to hell. Let's, let's give let's give God some time to work. All right, God might still be working on that person. You don't know. Christians be getting mad too. This is like the parable with the with the talent. You know, like the guy or no, like the. Which one was it? The parable with the the guys who worked in the field, right? And the the guy came at like three o'clock in the afternoon and he worked and he only worked like two hours or something. And then the owner of the field paid all the men the same amount. And the other the other guys got mad, right? Like, why did you pay that guy the same as you paid us? He didn't work as much as we did. And the owner's like, like, it's my money. I can do whatever I want with it. Christians be getting mad when you get saved at the last minute, right? People be getting saved on their deathbeds. Christians mad. He lived his whole life in sin. He doesn't deserve to go to heaven. Like, calm down, God. Are you God? Can you let God be God? Can Christians let God be God? Stop trying to be God? Christians be trying to say who, who can and cannot go to heaven. Especially them, like, them Pentecostals. Them Presbyterians, you know, like them strict religions, they be getting real mad about everything. Found out, found out you were watching me on, on YouTube. Y'all in trouble, by the way. All five of y'all, 
y'all in trouble at church right now for watching me on YouTube, for watching this heretic. Y'all going to get in trouble if your pastor finds out you're watching me. Your wife's calling your pastor right now. Uh, yeah, I saw him watching MK Mobile on YouTube. And uh, yeah, he was talking about some stuff and uh, doesn't doesn't really ag agree with our, our religious beliefs. Uh, we're going to need you to come in. Uh, yeah, I have a talk with him and take his phone away and delete his YouTube account. <laughs> uh, let's see what's going on, guys. I don't know what you're talking about, dude. This other... Can you please clarify the point that you're trying to make? <clears throat> okay. Thou hast no part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. That is a just judgment against a heretic. Oh, no. Am I the heretic? Oh, please, no. Not a heretic. Next, I'm going to be a blasphemer. Christians. Christians get triggered real easy, too, by the way. How you get triggered so easily? You love God. How you love God, Christians be getting upset about everything. Just like I said, I've reached a point of maturity. I can still go to Christian church. I still do. But, you know, I eat the meat and I spit out the bones. I mean, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, eat the meat and spit out the bones. That's, a, that's the difference between me and Christianity is I'm not trying to force you to believe what I believe. I don't care. St. Peter said that Simon was the first heretic. Okay. All right, let's get back to the... I'm going to stop preaching and ranting and raving. Let's get back to the uh, the reaction. Because it's what they feel is right. That's what they're interested in viewing as right. And they're more interested in how they view themselves than how other people view them. Now... Oh, oh. Conscious to some degree. There are still moments where you're concerned, like, what are the neighbors going to think? Or, hey, you're causing a scene at a restaurant when you're having a misunderstanding or something. I don't, I don't know what the different contexts would be. Outside of those, because those are exceptions, um, I, I admire the Christian women that I've been a part uh, around, I should say, uh, of some of the Christian women that I've dated. I think there is a higher caliber of women out there mm -hmm. who are devoted uh, overtly, I guess is a word for it. Um, they're willing to go out of their way to do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons because what is good is intrinsically good regardless of opinion or circumstance. You, what, percent, so, what percent of Christian women do you think that is? Just in your, again, oh no, right or, no right or wrong answer. It's just based <laughs> on, you know, I, I don't know what Detroit women are like. So, <laughs> you know, I know I've, I've got to spend a lot of time there. Even Pearly know that this guy is on the, he's on the, what's it called? What do we call it in the manosphere? The, He's on the hope aid or something. The hopium. He's on the hopium. Even Purdy's like, this guy is so full of hopium. That's why she's asking this question. Like, what percentage do you really think? She's trying to put him on the spot. Like, are you, do you really believe what's coming out of your mouth, sir? Come on. You know. You know, bro. Let's see what his there, answer so is. You, you tell me. <laughs> um... This this is going to be a tough answer, but my guess is going to be a third, probably thirty three percent. That's more than um, I would. Get. And I, I say that wholeheartedly <laughs> because um, I've met some who. Have... Pearly says that's more than I would give him, because she knows he's he's on the hopium. Come on, bro, get off the hopium, bro. Just go get a worldly woman. At this point, I would recommend a worldly woman before a Christian woman. If a guy came to me and said, hey, look, I got two options. I got a worldly woman who wants to date me. I got a Christian woman who wants to date me. I would say worldly woman, hands down. And the reason for that is that at least worldly women have some, you know, you can leverage some sort of kind of authority over them because Christianity takes all authority away from the man when they take away divorce. So when you take, when you take divorce out of the equation, 
how are you going to keep your woman in check? <laughs> no, hope you'll be strong with this one. So, hold on, guys. I got a lot more ranting and raving to do, but I got to take a little break. Let me let me cue something up for you guys. Hold on, guys. One second. Give me a second. Don't go anywhere, guys. This is going to be good. All right, I'm going to go take a break. You guys, it's going to be a quick break, like literally like three minutes, two minutes. But don't worry, I'm going to leave you guys entertained here. I got something funny for you guys. I got something really funny for you guys. I don't know if you guys were at, have watched my uh, series on Christian Dick Police. Uh, so I'm going to bring it up for you guys. Let me read your comment here, sir. Yeah. Modern Western churches are compromised. They are not fit for purpose. They present the sacred with the profane clouds without rain, sold out to feminism. Read your Bible. Get your discernment up. Yeah, true. Exactly, sir. Completely agree with that. Completely agree. I'll be right back, guys. Hold on, guys. We're going to go through our series, our Christian Dick Police series. Or should we do something more professional? Uh, oh, I don't know. Where did I start this series at? Here it is. Where is it? All right, Christian Dick Police. Here we go. we go guys you guys are gonna laugh you guys are gonna laugh if you're thinking about what another man's doing with his penis as a Christian man and you're gonna go and basically rebuke him for you know I don't know having sex with his girlfriend who he's not married to by law by your government law, it doesn't mean he's not married to her. Because the Bible says Isaac took Rachel into his mother Sarah's tent and she became his wife. That's biblical marriage. <clears throat> so if you're concerned about where another man is putting his penis, that's gay. I'm just saying, if you put it into perspective, that's kind of gay. Christian dick police are gay. What you want to get into first, Christian Dick Police or the Bible study? Because basically, we're just going to make fun of Christians for being gay because they like to look at other dudes' penises. I mean, they're basically more concerned about where other men put their penises than they are about God's word, focusing on God. How you call yourself a Christian and you love God but you're more worried about where another man is putting his penis, when he's putting it, how he's putting it. You shouldn't be, that should not be any concern of yours at all. If you're truly focused on the word of God. So we were going to do a reaction video. <laughs> Started talking about Christian dick police. I lost uh, all the viewers. I'm sorry. Did I offend you Christians? Did I, did I say something offensive? I'm sorry. Did you know that Jehovah's Witnesses do not sell? Oops. 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 I'm back, guys. I'm back. Did you enjoy the Christian Dick Police series? I got more videos. There's like 12 videos to Christian Dick Police. Made it a made it a whole dozen. It's it's true. I mean, am, am I lying? If I'm lying, tell me I'm lying. I, you're not going to hurt my feelings. 
Christian dick police all over the place, man. Trying to tell me I can't have heterosexual sex, but they got a gay pastor. They got a woman pastor. They got all these gay couples in the church. They don't tell them nothing about their gay sex. Want to come tell me something because I'm having sex with my girlfriend. Trying to be a man of God. Bringing my girlfriend to church with me. You know, praising the Lord. <clears throat> I'm praising the Lord. Bringing my girl. And so what? So what if we're having sex? Thank God for heterosexual sex. Can we make heterosexual sex great again? <clears throat> Christians be mad as hell. Oh, 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 you're shacking up. You're living together. Yes, pastor. I'm having straight sex. How about you go talk to those gay people over there? Huh? How about you deal with that situation first? Seems seems a little bit more. Kind of a bigger problem than my straight sex. Oh, no, 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 that's different. That's different. They know they're in sin. Do they? Did you tell them? They seem pretty happy. That gay couple's having a having a gay time at church. But I'm over here getting in trouble every week for having straight sex. <clears throat> Pastor won't tell that gay couple nothing. You know, you know you shouldn't be. Don't be alone with her. You're going to get tempted by the devil. Yes, yes, I got tempted by the devil to have heterosexual sex, Pastor. You should be thankful to God that you have one heterosexual couple in your church. Praise the Lord. Right? I swear, if I'm a when I'm a pastor and y'all guys come up to me talking about I had some heterosexual sex, I'm gonna be like, okay, I'm happy for you. Praise God. Praise the Lord. You had heterosexual sex. Okay, guys, in my church, it is perfectly okay. It is fine. You don't even need to tell me about it. If you come to me and say you're having heterosexual sex, we're, we're about to break out in worship. I swear to God, we're going to break out in worship. We're going to sing all the worship songs. Uh, what's, his, what's the one they always like singing these days? The what's, I can't even remember that song. Waymaker. Waymaker. <clears throat> he made a way. He made a way. God is bringing heterosexual sex back. Praise the Lord. Jesus, thank you for all these heterosexual straight men in my church. Why would you not be happy about that? <laughs> you have one normal couple left. Yeah, praise God. Praise God, Pastor. Why do you keep coming and talking to me? Like... I don't know what you want me to do. I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm sorry I can't control myself. I'm sorry that my girlfriend is so freaking hot. I'm sorry that my dick gets hard when I look at a naked woman. I'm sorry, Pastor. What do you want me to do? My body is operating in the way that God created it to operate. I look at naked women and my dick gets hard. That is a normal, God-given reaction to naked women. Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you look at a naked woman and your dick gets hard, praise the Lord. Just praise the Lord. Just thank God. First, thank God for being a man. I thank God. I love being a man. I love that God, God made me a man, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I love picking up heavy things. I love lifting weights. It makes me feel good. All right. I'm so glad. <clears throat> I'm so glad Adam got rid of Lilith. I like being on top during sex. Do y'all like being on bottom? I'm just saying. You can be on you can be on the bottom if you want. I'm not there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't be on the bottom. I'm just saying as a man as a man of God, I like being on top, clapping them cheeks, clapping them cheeks, pastor, them heterosexual, 
female cheeks, I was clapping. Because <clears throat> I'm a man. And when I look at women, attractive, thin, sexy women, my dick gets hard, Pastor. I can't help it. You know what? I don't you know what cast it out of me. Cast the spirit out of me, Pastor. Is that what you want to do? You want to cast the heterosexual spirit out of me? These Christian pastors, everybody in the church gay, they got a woman pastor. The one guy, one guy trying to be freaking normal is the guy they got a problem with. Go back and watch my, my live stream called Christian Dick Interventions. You're going to laugh your ass off. I'm a monk, but I'm not judging. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just this day and age, this day and age, as a pastor, I'm praising God for heterosexual couples. I'm praising God for heterosexual sex. I don't care if you're shacked up. As long as you're shacked up with a, it's a man and a woman shacked up. If it's a man and a man and a woman and a woman, I, you know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, thank God. Thank God for heterosexual sex. Because it's good. It's the way God intended. It feels good. You know, it's a beautiful, loving act that God created, by the way. And these God, these Christian police, Christian dick police are trying to tell you that you can't have heterosexual sex. What the hell? What the hell? They don't want you having sex. Talking about you're going to get tempted. Don't, don't put yourself in a, in a position of temptation. No, Pastor. There was no temptation. I wanted to have heterosexual sex. Pastor. There was no temptation at all. I wanted to. All right. If that was if that's wrong, I don't want to be right. If having straight sex is wrong, Pastor, I don't want to be right. All right. I'm just gonna we're just gonna have to agree to disagree on this one, Pastor. I like having sex with women. I'm sorry I let you down, Pastor. I really, really like having sex with women. Really. Like a lot. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. You're just gonna have to just you're going to have to let me slide on this one, Pastor, because I'm not giving this one up, Pastor. I'm not giving this sin up. All right. Why don't you go talk to that gay couple? <laughs> Pastors be huffing and puffing when you call them out. They be getting mad. Pastors get so mad when you call them out. Pray for pastors. Pray for Western Christian pastors. They need help. They need a lot of help. They, they got a hard job, you know dick policing and then all the gays coming in their churches and you know <clears throat> they got to keep everybody happy they got to keep the the heterosexual people happy they got to keep the gays happy they got to keep the government happy it that's hard that how do you write a sermon and you can't offend nobody that is a hard job <clears throat> i can't do it guys i don't care who i offend you might you might get offended that's how I'm going to start my sermon. When I go up on stage, I'm going to be like, look here, guys. Just a disclaimer, you might get offended. All right? If you like it in the booty, you might get offended. All right? If you're one of those effeminate males, you might get offended. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess religion is kind of man's tower of Babel to God. But there's still a place for it. And, and I mean, we do need some, some structure, some kind of order, right? Can't just have all kinds of craziness going on. Because, <clears throat> you know, these churches that don't have order, you know, they have all these women prophesying. You got like five different women with five different prophecies at the same time. Like, what the hell's going on in this church? This church ain't got no damn order. I mean, so there's a place for religion. Religion is order, and we need order because we have to. God is very specific, especially as we've been doing our Bible study in the book of Exodus and now in the book of Leviticus. 
God is very specific about how he wants things done when it comes to offering sacrifice, the building of the tabernacle. God is a very specific God, so we do need to have some kind of order in the church. We can't have five fat ladies prophesying five different prophecies that all contradict each other. You know, one fat prophetess gets up, I got a prophecy, the Lord just told me. Another fat lady gets up, I got a prophecy too, oh, praise the Lord. Well, hold on, guys. Too many prophecies going on at one time. Can't both of you be right? Which which prophecy is the right prophecy? I don't know. Set them both on fire. See what happens. Whoever God delivers from the from the fiery furnace. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know you weren't a Christian. I don't know what I, I just believe the Bible. I still kind of technically can call myself a Christian just because there's really no there's no religion on earth that fully believes the Bible. So technically there, there's no religion for me. <clears throat> uh, so I kind of just kind of stay in the Christian loop just because there's really like there's nowhere else to go. And like I said, you have to have the wisdom and the maturity to to eat the meat and spit out the bones. Uh, Christianity is, is, I mean, the government is going to basically at some point get rid of uh, Christianity or at the very least they're going to change, change Christianity because uh, the government's going to use, government has always used religion to control people. Uh, that's all Christianity is in the West. It's like a soft, it's the soft fist of the government. Uh, but with the population decline uh, coming, uh, we are, and with the Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 prophecy, we are going to see the government get more involved in religion in the next com coming years. And the government is basically going to really, really start using religion to uh, get people back to basically making babies because no one's having kids. No one's getting married. No one's having kids. Even Christians aren't doing it anymore. As you can see from this video that we're watching right now. <clears throat> well, yeah, the Bible says, All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it is not God's will that any man should perish, which is why Jesus hasn't come back yet, because a lot of Christians are going to be going to hell. Because uh, they don't read their Bibles. Which is what I'm going to talk about today in our Bible study. We're going to talk about, you know, does God forgive your ignorance? So that's the question we're going to answer today in our Bible study. Does God forgive people who are just ignorant of the truth? Uh, so there's a difference because a lot of people go to church. A lot of Christians go to church. They just sit there. They're just bench warmers. Uh, they just believe whatever the pastor tells them. They don't read their Bibles. So they're kind of just ignorant and naive of the truth and it's their it's, it's their own fault honestly your religious beliefs are your own responsibility just like anything else you need to read your bible yourself uh depending on because when you listen to a pastor that pastor's telling you number for one that pastor went to seminary or he went to some kind of bible college bible colleges do the same thing that secular colleges do they teach you what they want you to repeat they do not teach you the truth. They just teach you the lies they want you to repeat when you go out and preach. Uh, number two, everybody has their own views and opinions and uh, discernment, interpretation. You know, that, that man is preaching the Bible out of a whatever, if he's a, if he's a Democrat or if he's a Republican, he's preaching the Bible from that lens, right? He's interpreting it from that lens. So you can't really depend on what the pastor is telling you because you don't know where the pastor is coming from. You know, he might be a liberal. He might be a conservative. You don't know what you're getting. It's really your own responsibility to read your Bible and then discern it for yourself. Uh, come to your own conclusions and believe what you believe. You're free to believe whatever you want to believe. I, I don't care. I'm just telling you what I believe. So, but you don't have to agree with me. It's okay. It's okay if you don't agree with me. 
I'm not trying to force it down anyone's throat. Like Christians do. Christians are like, you're going to hell. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I had straight sex. Sorry, Pastor. You're going to hell. Having straight sex is not going to send you to hell, guys. Don't believe the Christians. That's, that's a lie. That is a lie. It's okay. It's okay to have straight sex. Should we get back into it, guys? Should we get back to the the reaction video? Let's get back to it. They've actually invited me on dates. Like I've actually been approached yeah. and been invited out. And yeah, I they got it. There's not many. There's not many men left. I mean, the women are. <laughs> There's not. <laughs> they're, they're, they can be aggressive in church. <laughs> you get a handsome. You get a handsome guy that walks in. They're all like, yeah. <laughs> so even with that, yeah. um, I've still been invited on things that I've had to say no to because they don't fit my standards. I don't go out to bars. I don't drink. I, I don't. I don't participate in that venue. I've had to when I was a kid because that's where a lot of the musicians would be that I wanted to participate and work with. So as a profession. So he's basically alluding to the fact that a lot of these women, these Christian women. They go to church, but then when they want to go out on a date, they want to go to like, you know, a restaurant that may have a bar. They want to have a little glass of wine, a little margarita. And he's saying, look, I don't drink, so I don't want someone who drinks. So, yeah, these women, and it's not even Christian women. We're just talking about women in general. We're just lumping them all into one general. Yes, I'm generalizing. I don't care. Uh, they got They got some alcohol problems. I'm just saying modern day women. Christian or not, got some serious alcohol problems. Because when you think about, because women like to drink wine, right? Women like wine. They got their little box wine, whatever. Uh, and men typically drink beer, right? When you think about the alcohol content comparison, if a man drinks a beer or two, beer is like, 4% alcohol, 4.5%, depending, doesn't matter. Wine is like 12% alcohol, and these women are, are down in a bottle of wine a night? That, that's a problem, guys. I mean, when you, compare, when you compare alcohol content, and it's like scientifically proven that female body cannot digest uh, alcohol as fast as a man body can, for, for, for whatever reason, you guys can look it up if you want, uh, but it is a fact. It, is, it takes women slower to, uh, the, the female body takes longer to process alcohol than the male body, which is why men can drink more than women do and not get, you know, like drunk. Whereas women, if a woman is drinking a bottle of wine a night or two, or maybe like a bottle and a half at 12% alcohol, that's a lot for a woman. As you know, it compared compared to a man who's drinking like a beer, two beers at 4.5% alcohol. So it would take a man, what, three beers just to get to 12% alcohol, and a woman's drinking a bottle of wine. A lot. It's a lot of alcohol. I'm just saying, guys. That was something that I did, and I made an exception for that. But now that I'm older and I value my standards more because it's more important to me as an individual, I don't frequent those atmospheres anymore. So to that extent, I would have to say a third uh, right. just because of the nature of the offers I've been on. So when I date, the, the third date thereabouts, I give the woman the opportunity to plan the date because I want to see what her creativity is going to be, right? And a lot of the times when I get there, I end up breaking off the relationship, mm -hmm. if you want to call it a relationship. I don't know what yeah. you call that, whatever. But by the third date, their idea is so far gone in violating what I'm interested in having around me that I'm just like, we're not a good fit. You're a great person. I wish you the best. No hard feelings. It's just, it's not for me. Yeah. Well, thank you for calling in to share your experience. I'm glad you did because I find more men like you than what they they paint. Most men want relationships. They, they want family. They want marriage. It's just, you know, there's not one. There's not enough marriageable women, and two, you know, they're worried about being a target. So, thank you, thank uh, you very I, much. I'm fearless. I'm not. A, I don't care about being a target. I'm just going to do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons. <laughs> all right. Um, it's an honor to speak with you, and I just wanted to give a quick moment. Shout out to you. Thanks for all you do. Keep doing great things. And I don't get starstruck easily. It's just not who I am. But I feel like.
Oh, oh my goodness. Now he's simping for Pearly. This guy simped for Pearly at the end. <laughs> he was sipping for Pearly. Okay, I kind of want to do this other interview that she did on the same video. Uh, but I think I'm going to have to do that in another live stream because we're already like an hour and 45 minutes into this one, guys. And I still got to do the Bible study today. It's going to be a short Bible study, though. It's a short chapter. It's a short chapter. Wait, you are in Leviticus chapter 6, guys. Leviticus chapter 6. Yeah, let's just do the Bible study and call it a day for today. And then we will come back tomorrow and finish this reaction video with the other guests that she had on the show. And then we still got two more videos. We got like long videos we got to get through. So there's definitely going to be a part five, maybe a part six. This is going to be a series, guys. Why you shouldn't marry a Western Christian woman. It's going to be a whole series. This next guest that she has on is actually better than the first one. I should have just did him first because he's actually he's actually better guest better at explaining the the situation in the western christian churches these days i can i can tell you guys some stories too my own personal stories oh my goodness so funny so funny i've literally had crackheads crackheads women that used to be crackheads turn me down like in the church christian women who like literally used to be crackheads talking about you're not righteous enough for me i literally had a former crackhead in the church she told me i wasn't righteous enough for her i was like you used to be a crackhead <laughs> i'm not making this stuff up guys i'm serious it's crazy so funny it's so funny guys uh so yeah that's what you got in your christian church you got you got ex uh adult stars now you got crackheads uh you got single mothers uh you got overweight women those those are your options guys in the christian church those are your options and they think they're too good for you by the way you got ex adult actors actresses coming to jesus because you know they got aged out of the industry you know and stretch marks on the side of the boobs are starting to show in the video they're like uh now nah, yeah you're fired you're fired and then uh so they had to come to jesus because they couldn't make any more money selling their bodies so now they want to start selling jesus i already did a reaction video to that one uh what else you got single mothers, three kids done popped out that vagina. Three big headed kids popped out that vagina. Can you imagine? I can't. I don't. I, you better be very well endowed. That's all I'm saying. If you're going to be with a single mother, that three big headed kids all popped out of. Make sure you're uh, you're bringing the heat. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you're bringing that. That whole forearm, I'm just saying, because there's going to be an echo in there, guys. There's going to be wind. There's going to be a lot of uh, queefs. Queefs. I don't think queefs are a good thing. If she's queefing a lot, that's because the air is getting in there because either she's too big or you're too small. I'm just saying. So that's what you guys got in the Christian church. You got all these fat women queefing. Uh, can't control their queefs because their vaginas are blown out. Their vaginas look like a hot pot hot pocket exploded in a microwave. <laughs> yeah, no pastor or priest is getting between me. Yeah, I got another. Re I got a lot of reaction videos to do, guys. Like I'm so far behind on reaction videos. I got a video where this guy said that the pastor told him he wasn't allowed to read his Bible. Uh, that's a funny one. That's crazy. They they really don't want you reading your Bibles, guys, by the way, because every time you actually confront a pastor with scripture, they flip their lids. They lose their minds, guys. If you and that's one reason why we have to read our Bibles, because the Bible says study to show yourself approved. Right. Pastors hate it when you know scripture. They hate it because they can't they can't explain it away. 
you hit them with scripture, they can't explain it away. They can't argue with scripture. You can't argue with God's word. You know, if you notice when you go to church these days, you go to Christian church, they'll give you one scripture, one little scripture at the beginning of the sermon. Uh, and then they'll talk for 45 minutes and never use a Bible scripture. After that, they'll just talk. 45 minutes, just talking. Telling some elaborate story. And uh, they got you hooked with the story. I've actually heard, I've actually had pastors tell me that in order to be a good pastor, you have to be a good storyteller. And I was like, whose story are you tell it? You telling your story or you telling God's story? <clears throat> tell that pastor to shove it. They don't want you reading your Bible, guys. They do. It, it, it's, it's detrimental to Christianity. And even there's a quote from Mark Twain that says, uh, the cure for Christianity is for people to read their Bibles. Uh, if, if everyone actually started reading their Bible all of a sudden, Christianity would not exist. It absolutely would not. Uh, there's no way that Christianity could stand uh, if people read their Bibles. So the only that the, the whole system is is a house of cards. It's all dependent on people being too lazy to read their Bibles, and, and it works. I mean, for now, it works. Uh, the government's about to change it in the next couple of years. We got Project 2025 coming. We got the Handmaid's dystopian future. Uh, which I'm fine with because it's biblical. Uh, the only people that are going to have a problem with the future are Christians. Uh, it's only going to affect them because they they love their wives more than they love God. And the, the government's about to tell them to uh, basically get barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen again because they need taxpayers. So there's that. I'm looking forward to it because I'm a man. So I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem putting babies in women. Although I only sell my unvaxxed sperm to Russia, China, and North Korea now. So, you know, for the artificial womb technology, <clears throat> that's coming too. I don't know what these women are going to do when they get the artificial womb technology working. What? If they don't need you to make babies, y'all going to see how much this government really cares about women as soon as they don't need them to make babies. They're about to be picking cotton or, I don't know, working in a salt mine, breaking rocks. There's no, they have, they have, they are, there's no use for them. There's no government use or value for them once they can't make babies. So artificial womb technology, they better hope and pray that God doesn't let that happen. Because if God lets the scientists perfect artificial womb technology, yeah, women are done, obsolete. Out the door, the government's going to cut every financial aid program like overnight in one day. That's exactly how it happened. If you watch the show, The Handmaid's Tale, they say everything happened in one day. It happened so fast that everyone was confused. They didn't know what was happening. And by the time it was over, it was done. What was done was done. The government was in control. Uh, the women were... The ones who couldn't have babies were off to the salt mines, and the ones who could have babies were off to the baby-making factories. So I'm just telling you guys that unvaxxed sperm is going to be very valuable in the near future. Very, very valuable. Governments are going to be seeking you guys out, making offers. So I'm selling to the highest bidder. <clears throat> Rachel and I are, are putting it in the freezer right now. Got a freezer full of sperm. I'm joking, but I'm not joking, guys. First government that comes to me and wants my sperm, if the if the price is right, they're getting it. I'm telling you right now. Because if you, if you don't sell it to them, there's going to come a, a point where they're just going to start taking it. Because the government's just going to do what they got to do. All right. So at first they're gonna be like, hey, look, let's uh they're gonna have all these little commercials on TV, these little campaigns, these advertisements, sell your sperm and make five thousand dollars and help your government, you know, let's boost the population, let's make the population great again, or something like that, you know. <clears throat> You're being a good uh, you know, patriot, a good citizen, you know, if you give the government your sperm to make babies. 
in our artificial womb technology. You guys think this is sci-fi. You think I'm just talking crazy right now, but give it give it six years. Give it six years, guys. At at the very least, yeah, five, six years. We're get we're getting there, guys. So my point is get sell it to them before they take it. Because there's only a there's it's only a matter of time. The offer is only going to be on the table for so long. Once they realize that they don't have enough guys selling their sperm, or they just don't have enough unvaccinated people, uh, they're going to come to your houses with a SWAT team. They're going to stick a needle in your balls, and they're going to take it. So you might as well sell it to them. I'm just saying. You might as well sell it to them. Because if you don't, you're going to get a gun to your head and a needle in your balls. Is that what you guys want? In front of your family, in front of your wife and kids, because they don't care. Government doesn't care if your wife and kids are watching. They'll come in there, bust, put a gun to their head too. They'll put a gun to your head. They'll put a gun to your wife's head. They'll put a gun to your kid's head. Stick a needle in your balls, take your sperm, and leave. Who's going to stop them? Ain't nobody going to stop them. Huh? Think your neighbors are going to come out? Their little pistols? Hey, leave him alone. He's a good guy. No, they're not. Because you know what? They don't want a gun to their head. Ain't nobody coming to save you guys. <laughs> All right, let me stop talking crazy talk before I met, I lose uh, lose my viewers. Should we do the Bible study real quick? What time is it? We are running out of... Yeah, let's do the Bible study. Let's do the Bible study. Get your Bibles, guys. All right, now I'm going to lose all my viewers. Okay, all the viewers can leave now. We're going to do Bible study, and you guys are going to get bored because we're in Leviticus. We're in Leviticus, guys. Leviticus chapter 6, actually. I got my Bible, but let me bring it up on the screen for you guys. Leviticus chapter 6. Sell it to them sounds better. Yeah, just sell it to them. You know, make as much money as you can, and then just try to find somewhere in the world where you can hide from the government coming to get your baby seeds. Uh, Leviticus 6, chapter 6. I did not spell Leviticus right. There we go. Chapter 6. Let me read it in the beta male NIV version. Just to make it a little bit more easier for you guys. All right, so the question we're going to answer today, and I might have to backtrack to, to some chapters before. Uh, let me just read this real quick. Okay, this might work. This might work. We might not have to backtrack. Uh, so... The revelation for today, even though, because I keep telling you guys, I know that these chapters are kind of boring for us to get through, but there is something, it's the word of God, okay? So there's something there that we can learn, something, there's something there. Just because we're not seeing it, doesn't mean it's not there, all right? There's something there that God wants us to learn. Uh, so I was thinking about that today, earlier this morning, and God revealed something to me. And the question is, does God forgive your ignorance? That's the question, all right? And that's the question we're going to answer today as we go through these so-called boring chapters of the Bible where God is basically giving instructions for very detailed things, the offering, the building of the tabernacle. It can get a little bit boring. I understand, but it's God's word. So let's get through it, guys, and let's try to see what God wants us to understand. So Keep in mind today, today the lesson is, the question is, does God forgive your ignorance? We're going to answer that question to the best of our ability, or I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to answer that question to the best of my ability through God's word, through the scripture today. Uh, so let's go. Let's go, guys. And I'm not going to keep you guys in suspense. We're going to, we're going to answer it right away as soon as we read these first uh because I think 
the answer is, and I, I think I've talked about it before. The answer is, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. God is a good God. God is a merciful God. God has grace and mercy on us. So God will forgive your ignorance if it's genuine, because the Bible says that God looks to the heart of the man. So God knows if you're genuinely ignorant or if you're just pretending to be ignorant. And that is where it gets kind of complicated when it comes to Christianity. Because we might have a lot of Christians sitting in the chairs, keeping the bench warm. They might be genuinely ignorant. But when it comes to your leadership, the Bible also says that, you know, the leadership's going to be held to a higher standard. Any pastor who reads his Bible on a regular basis, enough to prepare a sermon, multiple sermons per week, has probably seen some things in the Bible that revealed the truth to him, that he's willfully ignoring. In that instance, that is no longer ignorance. That is willful ignorance. God will not forgive that. So if you are genuinely ignorant, if God looks to your heart and sees that you are genuinely ignorant, God will forgive that. But if you have read this Bible, and you know what it says, and you ignore it because you're a pastor or you're a leader and it doesn't agree with your religion, I, 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 I wouldn't want to, to be in God's presence and be you. I just, I, I would be terrified. Like, <laughs> but these pastors, all I don't know how they justify it to themselves. I don't know how you read the Bible and ignore most of what it says, and then you go preach a sermon that makes everybody feel good. Oh, God, I just, I hope God has mercy on you. I hope he has grace on you. I believe that he can. I just don't know if he will. I honestly don't know. But that's not the question. The question today is, will God forgive your genuine ignorance the answer is, I believe, yes. So maybe we'll answer the other half of the question another day. But I don't have the answer for that one today. Not in the scriptures that we're going into today. So let's go, guys. Leviticus chapter 6, the NIV version, which I refer to as the beta male version. Because it's very easy to read. It's also very manipulated. The beta male version is... Um, uh, they took they they uh, manipulated the scriptures in this uh, version of the Bible. They took a lot of stuff out. Let's see, Leviticus chapter six. The Lord said to Moses, "Oh, let me bring it up on screen for you guys. I bring it up on the screen for you guys." The Lord said to Moses, "Which one? This one's good." And this is where we're going to see if God forgives ignorance because, and, and we also saw this in the, in the last chapter too. Let's pay attention to what God says. The Lord says to Moses, if anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted to them or left in their care or about something stolen, or if they cheat their neighbor, or if they find lost property and lie about it, or if they swear falsely about any such sin, the people may commit when they sin if they leave these ways and realize their guilt they may return what they have stolen or taken by extortion or what was entrusted to them or the lost property they found or whatever it was they swore falsely about they must make restitution in full add a fifth of the value to it and give it all to the owner on the day they presented their guilt offering. All right, let's read the whole thing and then let's go back up. And as a penalty, as a penalty, they must bring to the priest, that is to the Lord, the, their guilt offering, a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them before the Lord and they will be forgiven for any of the things they did that made them guilty. All right, let's go back up here to where God says, 
when they sin in any of these ways and realize their guilt, realize their guilt. So when they realize their guilt. Now, in the previous chapter, God talks about when they realize they sinned or when they become aware of the fact that they've sinned, which means God does forgive your ignorance. If you were ignorant and you were sinning out of ignorance, God says, when you realize you sinned, then you bring your sin offering. God doesn't, God isn't condemning you for a sin you didn't know you did. Oh, yeah, you're right. Satan tells folks the best lie. This is partly how a hum partly how the human condition can justify anything pastors included yeah like yeah i don't i don't i don't know i just can't i can't understand being a pastor waking up every morning knowing the truth of the bible and then going and just lying to people or just they don't really lie they just don't tell you the whole bible you know they just tell you the feel good parts or the parts that they know won't offend you or won't upset you so maybe that's how they justify it to themselves also we are very good at lying to ourselves yes we are all right so back to the question at hand the question was uh does god forgive your ignorance your genuine ignorance uh chapter five and chapter six of leviticus god repeatedly says when you've realized you've sinned so god is saying you've sinned and you don't even know you've sinned god isn't holding you accountable yet because you haven't even realized you've sinned god isn't punishing you for something you didn't even know you did so the answer to the question is yes god will forgive your ignorance however as soon as you've become aware you have to go offer sacrifice for the forgiveness of that sin and bear in mind this is old testament so before jesus so you still have to repent of your sin you still have to change your, you still have to stop sinning, you know. When, once you become aware of the sin, you still have to stop doing it. You can't just keep doing it because then you're not in ignorance no more. That's another another thing these, these Christian pastors want to do is they're banking. A lot of these Christians are banking on the fact that if they can remain ignorant, they can get a free pass into heaven. All right. There, like I just said, there's a difference between genuine ignorance and <laughs> what happened, guys? Oh man, I lost four viewers. The devil got mad. The devil got mad. Okay, what I was saying before we lost the 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 Christians and the the pastors, I think, are banking on the fact that they can get a get into heaven free card if they remain ignorant of the word of God. Lost all my viewers. Oh man. So we were having a good Bible study too. The devil messed it all up. So, yeah, sacrifices do point to the blood of Jesus. It's like a shadowing of what's to come. It's in the Bible, you know, blood always has to be shed for sin. Uh, there's no way around that. Just no way. Biblically, there's no way around that. Uh, so, my point is the point is, God is forgiving the people for their, He's not. Well, he's not forgiving them for their ignorance, but he's allowing them to come. He's not judging them for their ignorant sin. He's allowing them. He's waiting until they realize they've sinned. And then he's saying, okay, now that you've realized you've sinned, now you got to come and offer sacrifice for it. But if you're an ignorant, God isn't casting judgment on you. What I was saying before the stream just got cut off was that 
a lot of these pastors and a lot of these Christians, they want to remain willfully ignorant because they think they're going to get a get into heaven free card because they just they're they, they, they're going to get to heaven. Right. In the presence of God. And they're going to just tell God, well, well, I didn't know God. I just didn't know. No one ever told me any of this stuff. And God's going to say, but I gave you the book. Why didn't you read the book? Because they think they're going to get a, get into jail, get into heaven free card. Now, let's say, for example, you do read your Bible, and maybe you know you're young. When I was younger and I read my Bible, I didn't understand what I was reading. I was still ignorant, but I was trying to learn. See, there's a genuine ignorance, and there's a willful ignorance. God will forgive your genuine ignorance. God is not going to forgive your willful ignorance. You are probably going to be going to hell. I'm just saying. Now, once you come become aware of your sin, then you got to go make a sacrifice. And you got to stop sinning. Whatever that sin is, you got to stop doing it. At the very least, you have to make an attempt. You have to try to stop doing it. I understand some sins may be addictive and very hard to stop doing. But God also, once again, God looks to the heart. Even if you're still living in sin, God knows your heart. Because remember, Paul says, I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I do want to do. God knows if you're struggling with sin. Struggling with sin is not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. That means you're trying to stop. People who aren't struggling with sin, who aren't even trying to stop, you know, God's looking at their heart too and saying, this guy is not even trying. This guy is just sinning galore, right? So God knows your internal battle. He's looking at your heart. He knows if you're actually genuinely trying to sin, even though you're, if it, even if you're still sinning, God's like, all right, this guy's, this guy's trying, you know, you know, maybe, maybe you didn't sin one day and then you sinned the next day, you know, the same sin. If you have like a sin, like a, an addictive sin. Usually this applies to some sort of addiction. When it comes to sin, especially sin you can't stop, it's an addiction. Could be drugs, could be alcohol, something like that. And alcohol is not necessarily a sin. That's a whole different sermon. Christians, oh God, they want to condemn you to hell for having one beer. That's not a sin, guys. That's a lie that Christians made up. Let's keep going. I think we answered the question right off the bat. So let's finish the Bible study, guys. I think we we answered that pretty clearly. All right. Oh, let me put it back on the screen here. Put it back on the screen for you guys. Oh, starting to get hungry. Bible study about to be over. I'm like a Christian pastor. When it's lunchtime, church is over. That was a joke, guys. All these fat Christian pastors. Whoop. Oh, I'm getting hungry. Time to wrap this up. Let's see. The burnt offering. The Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar. On the altar hearth throughout the night. Until morning. And the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The priest shall then put on his linen cloths and linen undergarments next to his body and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he is to take off these clothes and put the others and put on the others and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially clean. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offering on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. So like I was saying before, very detailed Yeah, Paul was, I think uh, there comes a certain level of wisdom. I mean, we see that in the, in the song, the song of Solomon or the wisdom of Solomon, where 
and we know that Solomon specifically prayed to God for wisdom and God gave it to him, but that wisdom tormented him. Uh, so there is a certain level you reach where it, it almost becomes this constant internal battle with trying to be right with God and still constantly battling with your flesh. I mean, it doesn't go away, guys. As long as you're in the flesh, you are struggling with your flesh. Uh, so that's just something that we have to come to terms with as we grow in in our relationship with with God. But like I keep saying, God is looking at your heart. He knows the struggle. He knows if you're struggling. He knows if you're trying. And God will honor that and forgive that. You know, God will forgive that sin. So, because God's looking at the heart of the man. I mean, we even see all these leaders, that these men that God chose, they fell short. We see Moses, uh, you know, getting angry with the people and not following God's direction the way he told him. You know, God says, speak to the rock. And Moses hits the rock because he's angry with the people. And God, God still makes the water come out of the rock. God doesn't, you know, let the people go thirsty just because Moses didn't listen to God. So God still has mercy and grace on the people. Uh, we see David fall into adultery with a, a married woman, even though he had other women, he had other wives. It wasn't adultery until he got with a married woman. That's biblical. That's not Christianity doesn't agree with that, but who cares? They don't care about the Bible. Christianity only cares about what Christians want. Uh, hold on, guys. Okay, sorry. Uh, so we see these men that God chose. We uh, King Saul just completely got like a demonic spirit in him. Uh, all these men that God chose, they made mistakes. They messed up at some point in their their ministry, right? But that doesn't mean that God just like, okay, well, I'm done with you. God kept using those men, right? God kept using Saul and David was just next in line. You know, Saul just died in, in battle, right? And David was just next in line. He was chosen by God. Uh, you know, so <laughs> David was a bad, yeah. According to Christians, David was like the worst person in the Bible because he had, and Solomon too, right? Oh, you can't have, don't, don't even get me started on the polygyny thing. It's already too late. We're already two hours into a live stream. If I get started on the polygyny thing, we're going to be here for like five hours. Let me finish the Bible study, guys. Uh, the grain offering. These are the regulations for the grain offering. Aaron's sons are to bring it. Hold on. Aaron's sons are to bring it before the Lord in front of the altar. The priest is to take a handful of the finest flour and some olive oil together with all the incense on the grain offering and burn the memorial the memorial portion, portion on the altar as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Aaron and his son shall eat the rest of it, but it is to be eaten without yeast in the sanctuary area. They are not to eat it in the courtyard or the tent of meeting. It must not be baked with yeast. It has, I have given it as their share of the food offering presented to me like the sin offering and the guilt offering it is most holy any male descendant of aaron may eat of it for all generations to come it is his perpetual share of the food offering presented to the lord whatever touches them will be holy the lord also said to moses this is the offering aaron and his sons are to bring to the lord on the day he is anointed a tenth of an ephod of the finest flour as a regular grain offering, half of it 
in the morning and half of it in the evening. It must be prepared with oil on a griddle. Bring it well mixed and present the grain offering broken in pieces as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The son who is su succeed, who is to succeed him as anointed priest shall prepare it. It is the Lord's perpetual share and is to be burned completely. Every grain offering of the priest shall be burned completely. It must not be eaten. The sin offering. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron and his sons, these are the regulations for the sin offering. The sin offering is to be slaughtered before the Lord in the place the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is most holy. The priest who offers it shall eat it. It is to be eaten in the sanctuary area, in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches any of the flesh will become holy, and it, and if any of the blood is splattered on a garment, you must wash it in the sanctuary area. The clay pot, the clay pot the meat is cooked in must be broken. But if it is cooked in a bronze pot, the pot is to be scored and rinse with water. So burnt, burn the pot and then rinse it with water. Any male in a priest family may eat it. It is most holy, but any sin offering whose blood is brought into the tent of meeting is to, to make atonement is in the holy place must not be eaten. It must be burned up. All right, guys, that's Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 7, the guilt offering, the fellowship offering. Eating fat and blood is forbidden, so we're going to get into some dietary laws, some biblical dietary laws in the next chapter. Uh, Christians have a problem with that, too. Christians have a problem with biblical dietary laws. Uh, because they like to eat fat and blood and pork and everything. They like to eat it all, guys. And then they want to use that scripture in the New Testament that says everything is holy and is good to eat. I'm Look, that's true. That scripture is in the New Testament that says you can eat anything. However, should you? I mean... Sometimes it's like, just because you can, should you? Like, God put these things in the Old Testament because he cares about your, he cares about your health as well. Like, now, in the New Testament, we could say, okay, look, you can eat these things that are unlawful to eat in the Old Testament, and it's no longer going to be like sin. It's no longer unlawful. That doesn't mean you should. It's just not healthy, guys. It's just not. Stop eating the pork. Stop eating the fat. Stop eating the pork rinds, the cracklings. Stop putting the crap in your body. I know it's delicious. I know. I want to eat it too. But if God says you probably shouldn't eat it, you probably shouldn't eat it. I mean, if your doctor told you not to eat it, would you eat it? Y'all listen to your doctor more than y'all listen to God. <clears throat> Look, I know that the scriptures in the New Testament and Christians are like, oh no, it's all holy now. God made all the food holy. You just got to pray over it and it's not going to, I'm like, okay. Well, I mean, go drink soda and see if all your teeth don't fall out. Like, <laughs> there's still consequences to what you eat, guys. There's still consequences. I'm not saying you can't. I'm not judging you for eating a pig. I'm just saying it's the same thing with the alcohol. God says God doesn't say you can't drink, but God also says, uh, you shouldn't get drunk. So it's the same thing with the pork. You can eat it. You just probably shouldn't eat it like, you know, all the time. And I would personally recommend that you don't eat it at all, but that's just my personal recommendation because the Bible specifically says not to eat it. And I know that sounds like, oh, you're being religious. That's what Christian Christians always, they're the ones being religious. And then they want to, as, as soon as you bring up something in the Bible, oh, you're being religious. 
you're being religious, but they don't want you, but they don't let you drink beer. Mm. You know, Christians are like, you can't drink one beer or you're going to hell. As soon as I bring up pork in the Bible, oh, you're being religious. You're being religious. I'm like, you just said I can't drink one beer. And that's not in the Bible. But the Bible says don't eat a dirty pig that rolls around in the mud. But you love them cracklings, don't you? You love them cracklings. Oh, don't take my cracklings away. Don't. Jesus. Jesus, don't take my cracklings away. I can't. Y'all give up Jesus before y'all give up cracklings. That don't make no damn sense. That don't make no damn sense. Y'all mad at Jesus because he said y'all can't eat cracklings. Make a whole new religion. Whole new rules. Just to just to eat what you want to eat. Look, look, a bag of cracklings probably not going to give you a heart attack. I'm just saying. 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, you've been eating cracklings your whole life. You go to the doctor. The doctor's like, <laughs> doctor's like, look, man, you about done. All right, make peace with your God. You're on the way out. It was probably the cracklings. I can't say for sure, but I can say probably it was the cracklings. You're all clogged up, clogged up with the pork. Pork got you all clogged up. Pork grease, pork fat. The pork, ugh, the pork fat. You're not supposed to eat the fat, guys. That's not food. The meat is food. The fat part is not food. You're not, the, no. God did not create the fat to be food for you. He created the meat of the animal to be food for you. I'm just saying, guys. I'm ranting and raving, guys. I got I got to go to work, guys. I'll see you guys next time. Or you know what? Let's uh, let's hang out for a little while longer. Let Let me put some. Let me put this live stream on autopilot for you guys. I'm about to put it on autopilot for you guys. Hold on, guys. Hold on. Don't leave me yet. I got some good stuff for you guys. I got some good stuff. You guys are going to be laughing your asses off. Let's get in it. Let's get in it. Let's get in it. Hey, you know what? Let's just start from the beginning. We're just going to start from the beginning and let it play. Woman must be the, the wife of one husband. It doesn't say a woman must be the, the wife of one husband. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say a header a, a, a gay man must be the husband of one husband. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say a gay woman must be the wife of one wife. It doesn't say that. And yet, you let women preach. You let homosexuals preach. You let single homosexuals preach. You let single women preach, unmarried women preach. But you won't. You just you just get so angry about a heterosexual single man being a pastor. Somehow that infuriates you more than a single woman preaching or a, a homosexual man preaching. You get more infuriated about a single heterosexual man preaching the word of God than you do about a gay man preaching or a woman preaching. Yeah. So I believe this guy really does have a heart for God and a heart for the people. And that is why he is still a pastor and now a senior pastor because God has exalted him, not men. See, this other guy is mad 
because he's trying to work his way up the system and get exalted by other men. He's trying to get ordained by men. He, he doesn't want to get ordained by God. He doesn't want to be, he's not trying to get chosen by, because when you're chosen by God, ain't nothing going to stop you. All right. Ain't nobody going to stop you. Ain't nothing going to get in your way. And that's why a lot of these Christians get mad when they see other people rise up the ranks before they do because they're just not chosen. You can have a happy marriage here on earth and worship your wife for, you know, 60, 70, 80 years and then spend eternity in hell. Or you can put God first. You can worship God and just get a divorce. I mean, it's not even not that big a deal like you're not married under god you're married under the state just divorce her stay single or hopefully find another woman who you who can get in the right order of things biblical order but ultimately put god first serve god and don't even worry about women don't even think about women like if you're putting god first god's gonna send you a woman right like a woman and if you if you want a woman you know what does god say you know all these things will be added unto you right that includes a woman what's the scripture just make another statement here it's very easy to stay married if you worship women i guarantee you no man has a problem staying married when he worships his wife you have a problem staying married when you worship god instead of your wife you have a problem staying married when you put god first instead of your wife that is what the problem is here all right so you sir yeah you don't have any problems in your marriage because you put you just said you put your wife above god so you made your wife a god to you so she's fine she's happy because she's being worshiped she knows she's your god so she, yeah, she's not going to go nowhere. You're not going to have no marriage problems. I'm going to tell you, that's the secret to a happy marriage, by the way. Worship your wife. Although you will be going to hell. So you can have a happy marriage here on earth and worship your wife for, you know. 2011, I went through a divorce. You all know that. Publicly divorced in this church. When I got divorced, people in the city turned on me that I didn't even know care yep preachers and ministers and churches that used to invite me to preach yep. still will not invite me to preach there were words and this is why i respect this man because i know he went through this i know he went through all of this hatred discrimination for being a single pastor and he could have given up he could have very easily just said you know what god these christians are not going to let me preach now because i'm single but he didn't give up and i respect this man for that because even though he went through a divorce, even though he knew he was going to be ridiculed, he knew he was going to be judged by his own brothers and sisters in Christ. He still kept following what he knew was the will of God for his life, and that is to preach. And now he's a and now in the let me set order. See, that's what they don't want. That is exactly why they do not want a heterosexual single male preacher, because he just said, let me set order, because men put things in order. Men do. Especially a single man will put things in God's order. A married man will, will, will give the illusion of order, but it won't be in God's order. You know, it'll be in the, the Western Christianity, beta male, uh, ma matriarchal order where the woman comes before the man. But he has a, but he's a single man. So he has no woman to put before God. So God is always going to be first in his life. God, then him, you know, then like whatever his calling is, his church, his congregation, he's serving God. There is no distraction in this man's life. But somehow. There are men out there who are very capable of preaching the word of God, but according to westernized Christian doctrine rules, they're simply uh, they're disqualified 
simply because they don't have a wife. I mean, think about that. Think about being disqualified from preaching the word of God because you don't have a wife. That, that in itself puts the woman above God. That in itself exalts the woman above God. That in itself proves that Christianity worships women. They do not worship God. These other churches who still refuse to allow single men to be pastors, uh, they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle uh, a lot in the near future as as fewer and fewer men uh, basically refuse marriage. It's not like they can't get married. They, they're, they're willfully refusing marriage because they know it's not biblical and they know the, the dangers of marriage in the West. But there is a lot of men like myself, and I know a lot of men who are single men who actually do read their Bibles, who are very spiritual, very religious. Uh, so there, there are men out there who are very capable of preaching the word of God. But according to westernized Christian doctrine rules, they're simply uh, they're disqualified simply because they don't have a wife. I mean, think about that. Think about being disqualified from preaching the word of God because you don't. Isaac took Rebecca into his mother Sarah's tent. And he was comforted after his mother's death and she became his wife. What did they do in the tent? Good old fashioned hole in one. I'm just saying that's biblical marriage, guys. Because the Bible says she became his wife. All he did was take her into the tent and have sex with her. And then she became his wife. Biblical marriage. No, let's go to the courthouse. Let's ask the pimp daddy government for permission to have sex with his property. Which, by the way, if you have a marriage license, your wife is property of the government. She's just on loan to you. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, because I know it does. I know it hurts your beta male Christian feelings, your westernized matriarch. You didn't have to. Nobody forced you, by the way. The government cannot force you to sign a marriage license. And there's a reason why. The reason is because they understand the Bible better than you do. They know their bounds. They know what they can and cannot do within the context of the Bible. They know what God will allow them and not allow them to do. They cannot force you. The devil cannot make you do anything that goes against God. That is why you have to sign it of your own. Feelings. Your westernized, matriarchal, beta male Christian feelings get hurt when you have have to comprehend the fact that your wife is basically a government whore. I'm sorry. I know it's harsh, but you sign that contract. You sign that paper. And that's what you, you actually made her a whore, by the way. You're the one who signed the paper, so you made her a whore. It's actually your fault. If you hadn't signed the paper, she wouldn't be a whore. Uh, she would be your property and not government property. So you signed her over to the government. But, but really, she was the government to begin with anyways. That's why you had to go get permission from him. Daddy, daddy government. But you didn't have to. Nobody forced you, by the way. The government cannot force you to sign a marriage license. And there's a reason why. The reason is because they understand the Bible better than you. All right. So in the future, in the very, very near future, like now, uh, if they want male pastors, they are going to have to adapt to the fact that most men in the future are going to be single. This is just something that Christianity, westernized Christianity is going to have to accept if they want to continue to have male pastors in their church. Uh, they're going to be single. All right. We're looking at about a 98 <laughs> percent. 
98 percent of men that are, are not getting married in the west so how do you think you're going to find anyone to work in your church if one of your qualifications is that they have to be married you're not all right so the next generation of pastors of male pastors of heterosexual male pastors will be single and the church will have to make some amendments to their beliefs the westernized christian feminist uh, beta male tradcoms are going to have to make some changes so let's get into it guys if you have joined this church because you think you're going to marry me this needs to be your last sunday this may sound good but it's not there's a clip that I saw from a pastor from my home state of Indiana. Oh, you can already tell from the intro, he's hot. I don't know what. Hold up, guys. Let me bring up something. Let me bring up the new videos. Wait, did I turn the mic back on? Okay, Let me bring up the new videos. It's more funny. The new videos are funnier. Let's bring up the new videos. Let's see what we got her. Go here. And add to stage. Man, what is wrong with my internet today? All right, let's go, guys. Christian Dick Police Series. Actually try to police other men's dicks more than the world does, by the way. I mean, they will be all up in your grill if you bring a girl to church. Talk about y'all married. When y'all getting married? Why are you not married yet? Have y'all been spending sleeping alone? Does she come over to your house? Do you go like that? None of that is none. Of, like, who, why do you even care? Are you focused on God? <laughs> That's not what the Lord can do for you. Ask what you can do for the Lord. Exactly. They're not focused on God. They're focused on other men's dicks. And where another man is putting his dick. And you're going to try and tell me that's not like a little big gay. That's a little big gay. All right. That's. That's like that's that's the tip of gay. All right. That's just putting the tip in. Putting the tip into homosexuality. I'm, it's kind of gay. That, that's you're a man, right? You go to church. And you're actually investing time inside your head, thinking about what another man is doing, who he's sleeping with, who he's having sex with. Like, you know, let's just say you have a girlfriend. You're a dude at church. You have a girlfriend. You, got, you guys are both going to church. You both love the Lord. You just happen to not be married yet. And you, you're probably having sex. Let's just say you're probably having sex. And that's fine by biblical standards, by the way. However... It's not fine by um, Christian standards. Christians have a problem with men having heterosexual sex uh, outside of pimp daddy government uh, control. So, but they're okay with a gay pastor. They're okay with a woman pastor. They're okay with a gay woman pastor. All that stuff is fine with a Christian, but a heterosexual man cannot have. All that stuff is fine with a Christian but a heterosexual man cannot have heterosexual unmarried unmarriage licensed government controlled sex somehow that's wrong but a gay man can be a pastor a woman can be a pastor a single woman can be a pastor like literally everything else is okay in christianity except being a heterosexual man having sex with a heterosexual woman outside of their government enforced rules not god's enforced rules their government because their government is their god by the way so stick that up your homosexual pipe hole and suck on it all right and then they're homophobes on top how are you going to be a homophobe when you spend half your day thinking about where another man's putting his dick talking about i'm a I'm half your day 
thinking about where another man's putting his dick. Talking about, I'm going to get a group of guys together, and uh, we're going to get the pastor, and we're going to have a little intervention. You're going to have a dick intervention. It, you guys go to these churches, by the way. You guys go to churches where they have dick interventions. And you're going to tell me that's not gay. That's funny. To, that's so funny. <laughs> Holy. I'm laughing at myself. You guys go to church for a dick intervention. <laughs> dick intervention. They can tell you where you are, where you're allowed to put your dick and where you're not allowed to put it. So other men can tell you, as a heterosexual man, other men who claim to be heterosexual, other men who have wives, by the way, like I, if you have a wife, go f your wife. Why? You're, you must not be getting it. Isaac took Rachel into his mother's tent and she became his wife. That is exactly, almost word for word, what the Bible says. And that is biblical marriage. But you guys want to tell a straight man that he's not allowed to have sex with his girlfriend, his straight heterosexual girlfriend, on top of that, you got a gay pastor. So it's okay to have a gay pastor who has sex with other men. It's okay to have a woman pastor who may or may not be married. Who knows? All of that stuff is okay within the realms of westernized matriarchal Christianity. But a heterosexual man just minding his own business, him and his girlfriend just ha happy and in love together. They're probably going to get married eventually, you know. They're just enjoying their lives, loving God, going to church. And yeah, they're having sex because they're in love. You guys let God deal with it. Don't go talking about John having sex with his girlfriend. They're not married. Don't go trying to get the pastor and like a, they want to get a group of guys together and confront you about it and have a dick intervention. Be like, oh, John, can we, uh, uh, can we can we talk to you over here for a little while? Uh, we just we heard that uh, you may be um, uh, fornicating with your with your girlfriend that you've been bringing to church, and and uh, we just want we just want to let you know that uh, here here in this church, uh, we we don't um, approve of that behavior. Uh, yeah, you're not allowed to have heterosexual sex in this church uh, with your heterosexual girlfriend uh, before you get a government issued permission from her pimp daddy uh, government controller, owner. So we would appreciate it if you could just um, uh, tone it down, uh, just just keep it. Uh... Look, if you think about another man's penis, that's gay. There's no way around it. I don't know how, any other way to put it, but your Christian men, you spend a lot of time thinking about where other men are putting their penises, and then you want to go rebuke them for it, right? You want to go to another man and say, hey, you should probably get a marriage license before, you know, you have sex. You need to get married by the pimp daddy government before you need, you need to go get permission from the pimp daddy government. It has nothing to do with God, by the way. They're not policing your dick because they care about what God wants or what God says or what God thinks. They're policing your dick because they work for the government, by the way. Your pastor, your westernized, matriarchal Christian pastor, works for the government. If he didn't work for the government, he wouldn't be trying to force you to get a government marriage license, which is unbiblical. The Bible says Isaac took Rachel. In All right, guys, that's going to be the show for today. My internet is messing up. I don't know what the heck's going on. Uh, stay tuned. I think we got about four more videos of Christian Dick Police coming. Uh, they're going to be uploading in the next day or two. Uh, so stay tuned for that, guys. It's going to be quite hilarious, quite entertaining. Also, I got the live stream series of Christian Dick Police if you want to watch the whole thing. Also, go back and watch my last two. What are we on? Part three of why you shouldn't marry a Western Christian woman. 
go back and watch part two. Part two was pretty good. Part one kind of sucked. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so, and tomorrow we'll be back for part four of why you shouldn't marry a Christian woman. And it's looking like this is going to go, I can say for sure, probably to part six. It may, may go to part seven or eight. Uh, so this is going to be this turning into a whole series, guys. Why you shouldn't marry a Western Christian woman. Stay tuned, guys. I'm going to try to come back tomorrow around uh, around the same time, between 9.30 and 10.30. I'll be live again. To, well, that's my time here in the Philippines. Uh, what time is it going to be in the West? It's going to be like maybe 8, 8 p.m. in the West depending on where you live. So uh, stay tuned, guys. Stay tuned. It's going to be freaking epic. Uh, we're just going to have fun, guys. We love Jesus here. We love God. But we're men. And sometimes as men, we just we just act stupid sometimes. And we have fun. And we enjoy the life that God gave us. All right? We embrace our masculinity here. And we make jokes. And it's fun. So I will see you guys tomorrow for part four of why you shouldn't marry a Christian woman. All right. Stay tuned, guys. We still got a lot more to come. It's going to be freaking hilarious. So much more fun. MK Mobile Gaming in the Philippines signing out.